Good morning, everyone. It's 9 a.m. live from the NASDAQ market site in New York City. I'm Brad Smith alongside Diane King Hall, and this is Yahoo Finance Live. Here is your morning rundown. Markets breathing a sigh of relief on the back of dovish comments from Fed Chair Powell. He signaled officials may be moving away from another hike, but JP Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon says he suspects the Fed may not be done raising rates in an exclusive interview with Yahoo Finance. And in the face of sticky inflation, the consumer is doing pretty well. Diamond telling Yahoo Finance, even if the U.S. is heading into a recession, the American consumer is in pretty good shape thanks to a hot labor market. Earnings out this morning from coffee giant Starbucks signal U.S. consumers are still splurging on their morning coffee, but the China consumer, not so much. Plus, a health check. Nova Nordisk and Eli Lilly see earnings surge on the weight loss drug boom. Nova Nordisk is focused on boosting output to keep up with demand for Ozempic and Wegovy. And Lilly, optimistic its star diabetes drug will soon be approved as an obesity treatment. But Moderna wasn't as lucky. Excess COVID treatments cost the pharma giant upwards of $3 billion in the third quarter. We'll talk with the Moderna CFO in our 10 a.m. hour about plans for the post-COVID era. Meanwhile, uh, another pause from the Fed, but this time not so hawkish as the committee voted unanimously to hold rates at the 22-year high. And Fed Chair Jay Powell reiterated they intend to, quote, proceed carefully. Still, as he does, Powell left the door open for the possibility of more rate hikes. But according to KPMG's chief economist, Diane Swank, quote, they just won't have the information they need by December. So there's a lot of chatter about what does this all mean? The door is still open for the potential of another rate hike, you Mm -hmm. know, and there's uh, chatter about the expectations of will it be in December? Will it be in 2024? Will it be another 25 basis points? Will it be 50? Will it be more? You know, and Powell even talked about the implications of that, especially when we think about the potential uh, for mortgages at 8% levels and higher. Yeah, there were a lot of key points that really came out of the press conference yesterday from this decision, and particularly three things jumped out to me. First thing, saying a few good months, uh, not good enough, basically, in terms of getting towards or getting ultimately a a achievement of that 2% goal sustainability, uh, sustainably for inflation. So that was one thing there in getting towards that goal and and how they do so. So a few good months of data, not enough there. Also, they mentioned geopolitical tensions. Uh, He was responding to that, acknowledging that they were elevated. But it seems like they're more focused even on what the potential negotiations in D.C. could look like and the risk of a government shutdown. He acknowledged that that still is very much present. And then lastly here, on wages, where we think about that employment data that's going to be dropping tomorrow, where we'll have some special coverage of that for our viewers early in the morning. He said that it's ultimately, in their thinking, not the case that wages have been the principal driver of inflation so far, although does think it's very fair to say that as we go forward, monetary policy becomes more relative to supply side issues talked about unwinding some of the pandemic effects. So it may be that the labor market becomes more important over time, too, in that instance. Which he said that before about wages not being the uh, piece of inflation that is the most difficult part to deal with. Yeah. 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 So that messaging sounds similar to uh, messaging that he's given before. But it's really just this tight rope. Uh, yeah. that Powell continues to walk of the not too hot, not too cold, this data-dependent Fed. He's saying, we're going to decide this meeting by meeting. Mm-hmm. So who knows what will happen in December? And he says, you know, basically that um, that there could be room for more tightening. There could be room for avoiding more tightening. So it's, you know, it's really this tight tightrope act that he's walking. Absolutely. Well, you had a lot of commentary coming out after the Fed's decision yesterday. According to J.P. Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon, the FOMC may not be done yet. He sat down with Yahoo Finance executive editor Brian Sazi to discuss the latest Fed decision. Let's take a look. I think they're kind of right to pause here a little bit and see what happens. Uh, but I suspect that they may not be done. I think there's a chance that inflation is just a little stickier than people think. And the fiscal and monetary stimulus of the last you know, several years is, is more than people think. Unemployment is very low. Uh, we'll see. They have a long way to go on inflation. I think Chairman Powell, Jerome Powell, uh, made that very clear. How much higher do you think they have to go on rates? So you have to separate rates into the short end, mm-hmm. and it's called the 10-year. 
And on the short end, they are, you know, five and three-eighths, whatever. Maybe 25, 50, 75 more. You know, and I'm not predicting that. I just think there's a higher chance than probably other people think. The tenure is not set by them. So that went up, you know, they influence it with words and stuff like that, but that's supply and demand of buyers of bonds from around the world. The supply is up dramatically, much more than people would have expected even a year ago. Uh, and QT is also uh, increasing the supply of bonds out there. So is Japan, China, and some other, you know, prior buyers. So that I think there may be pressure in that 10-year rate to go up. Inflation stickier. Uh, you know, it's not abnormal to have a five and a half or six percent or even seven percent tenure rate. And you know, I, I don't look at that as a prediction. I look at that as come more like risk management. You know, don't don't rule it out when you look at how you manage your company that rates can go a little bit higher. I should also point out the spreads are still very low, so credit spreads themselves can go up. So you know, it can be a little bit of a double whammy for for borrowers. Has the economy felt the impact of? the Fed's rate hikes, and then I know you've talked a lot about quantitative tightening. Has markets and the economy felt these things yet? Yeah, so the, 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 the Fed, you see it, like remember mortgages are a lot of fixed rates, but it's clearly affecting uh, house sales, uh, home sales and stuff like that. Not home prices yet, there's still a lot of money out there, and, uh, but it's affecting auto sales and credit card, and uh, over time it'll affect businesses that have to refinance, any floating rate bar, so, so yeah, of course it's depressing certain economic activity. It's hard to figure exactly how much. Quantitative tighten is almost more of a technical thing, like what's enough, when's enough. I personally believe that, that at one point it will rattle the markets. It kind of did in March 2020. It did, if you go back to uh, 19, market makers are more, are, are more, they can't do as much as they used to do for a whole bunch of different regulatory reasons. And so I think at one point, yeah, you're gonna see markets get a little, little rattled. And where does that rattling show up first, you think? Treasuries. Treasuries. Yeah. And that hasn't, has the treasury market been rattled already, just given the ascent we've seen in the tenure? Not, well, if you look at, not really, but liquidity has come in. Uh, and, you know, you should try to keep an eye on that. And like I said, there's more issuance. And the issuance has to be bought. And it may, you know, that may push the price higher. So, uh, but you haven't seen real, tre you know, uh, pressure in the repo markets, the overnight markets. Chair Powell mentioned uh, the 8% mortgage, and he sounded somewhat uncertain what that may or may not mean to the housing market yeah. next year. What are you seeing in housing in this country, given where rates are? Yeah, well, first of all, the big thing, keep in mind also, very different than prior times. We have, we have still a lot of fiscal stimulus with very low unemployment, and, and consumers actually in rather good shape. They have low, unemplo uh, low unemployment. Uh, home prices and asset prices have gone up for the better part of 15 years. They may be now and now, but their, their equity in their home is at all-time records. They locked in a lot of fixed-rate financing, particularly in mortgages, which is like 70% of consumer borrowing. So they're actually in pretty good shape. You know, it, but it's definitely dampening new home buyers, slowing down people's ability to move. People today are you know, doing adjustable rate mortgages, but the cost of carrying a mortgage is higher. So, you know, buyers either are gonna buy a smaller house, which is a choice, or they're gonna wait or, or, uh, or not buy at all. What should, there's a lot of regular average people using Yahoo Finance consistently. That's the hallmark of our pl platform. What should they be prepared for in terms of the economy because of where rates uh, are right now? Yeah. I think the most important thing when you think about the world is think about it broadly. And don't just try to guess that there's one thing that's gonna happen. You know, almost no one has ever forecasted accurately like what I call real inflection points. And so when I look at it is again as a risk management thing, the most important thing that's taking place is geopolitical. It's it's Ukraine, Israel, war, death, you know, free nations in Europe. It's affecting everything, obviously a humanitarian crisis, it's affecting uh, global trade, global alliances, very importantly America, China. Uh, so I, I put that as, I, I would put that in the worry category. You don't know, and I don't want to, this is so important, the geopolitical part. Yes, it'll have an effect on the economy, and it'll may determine whether the economy goes to a hard landing or a soft landing, but we don't know that yet. I mean, hopefully these things will diminish, but they may not. So, you know, as a, someone running a company, I try to run the company such that whatever the range of potential economic outcomes are, we could serve our clients. We'll be there in thick or thin. We can bank cities, states, schools, hospitals, individuals, that we can invest in our technology, that all these small businesses who rely on us, that we're there for them through thick or thin. We're building, we're going, and you know, we can manage the, the economy, which I look like the weather. So I guess my advice is, look at a potential range of outcomes and challenge yourself how you feel about if those range of outcomes happened. And so, uh, so, you've, so you've really thought it through.
And you do that before you say, this is what I think is going to happen. In terms of higher for longer rates, is that the new normal? And what does it mean for big banks like JP Morgan? Yeah, so I, I personally think we may have gone, you may have had a sea change. And the sea change was that we've had 20 years plus of r lower rates. And, and now, all of a sudden, it looks to me there's a lot of long-term inflation. So if we get monthly numbers and stuff like that, long-term inflationary effects, a $2 trillion deficit, the largest peacetime deficit ever, the largest peacetime deficit with all-time unemployment lows, uh, but you also have commitments that are being made. You know, the IRA Act, the CHIPS Act, the green economy, we think will eventually cost $4 trillion. I hope it's well spent, though I suspect a lot of it will not be well spent. Uh, you know, in Europe, when oil and gas prices went way up, they basically financed it for all consumers and producers. You know, so government, and then we have aging populations, Social Security, Medicare. There's a lot of concerns. But there are a lot of things which I say are future inflationary. Mm -hmm. I don't see anything which is future disinflationary. Now, of course, recession is disinflationary, but, but I see all these trends, so it may be a sea change, so that, you know, if you go back to the 70s or 80s, you know, rates were higher, they were kind of more volatile, people didn't, you know, no one looked at a 2% rate like that was normal. Are, are the, have the seeds been planted for something like a Volcker recession? Look, I'm not asking you to predict a recession, yeah. but are, are the, have the seeds been planted? Well, when you say Volcker recession, okay, so remember interest rates got to 14 and three quarters of the 20 year bond mm -hmm. in 1982. I, I mean, unemployment hit 10 or 11. Uh, so I, I'm not, I don't think we're going to go there. Like I said, the consumer is in very good shape. So even if we go into recession, the consumer is going in be better shape than they've gone into most recessions. Uh, uh, and companies are still hiring workers, so it's not quite clear. I mean, I, I wouldn't call it that bad. I just think that the, there's a lot of deficit financing, and that may cause long-term rates to go and stay higher in inflation for a little bit longer. How concerned are you about, about the deficit, and, and what do these rising deficits also mean to, to the economy longer term? But you said, okay, you said, what does it do for JP Morgan? JP Morgan, we run the company, says so that if there were 7 or 8% long bond rates, we're going to be fine. We, we don't, we don't, we're not guessing for it, but we stress for it. So, you know, we stress for a whole bunch of different things to basically to make sure we can handle low rates, high rates, high rates with inflation, high rates with recession, high rates with real estate losses, that no matter what those are, the team is still in pretty good shape. Fortress balance sheet. And, and, and pretty good shape means that we can serve our clients regardless of that. That's what it means to me. Not like, well, if that happens, I gotta, I gotta pull back, I can't invest, I can't grow, I can't serve people. and. And so we'll be fine. I suspect that those higher rates, you know, Warren Buffett talks about when the tide goes out, you see yeah. dressing, swimming naked. You're going to see quite a few people swimming naked. They had embedded rate interest rate exposure they didn't understand. They couldn't take the double whammy of, of you know, stagflation or, you know, bad real estate or something like that. And that was just part of Yahoo Finance's exclusive interview with J.P. Morgan chairman uh, and CEO Jamie Dimon making it clear the possibility of the Federal Reserve rising uh, and the raising rates more than once in 2024 still on the table thanks to stickier inflation. For more on Dimon's takeaways on the Fed and the economy, let's bring in our panel. We are joined now by Nick Timoreos, who is the Wall Street Journal chief economics correspondent. And we've got Claudia Sam, Sam Consulting founder and former Federal Reserve board economist. Great to have you both here with us. Uh, you know, as we're kind of continuing to let some of those thoughts ring through our minds of what Jamie Dimon had to say there, Nick, I want to go to you first just on what this sets up for a Fed that we just heard of and, and ultimately how the banks uh, are thinking about the Fed's positioning and the way forward from here. Well, I think what we heard yesterday is that the Fed is still in inflation fighting mode but Powell seems more confident that they can fight inflation without having to raise interest rates further and instead just by holding rates steady. And so that's a change uh, from, from maybe a few months ago. You know, he I think he knows how to signal a plan to hike again. And he declined several opportunities to do that on Wednesday, including uh, at times I thought he was distancing himself from the dot plot, the summary of economic projections in September where a majority of officials had projected one more rate increase this year. Of course, because of the calendar, we know that would have to be in December. And he and he didn't really you know, point back to it. So one, one interpretation, you could say he was keeping his options on the table, wasn't ruling anything out. That's certainly true. But uh, some of the body language, his read on the economy suggested 
uh, he doesn't want to hike again if he can, you know, if the data can can uh, support that. Uh, Claudia, I want to bring you in here and ask uh, this question to you. What's your take on Diamond's interpretation of the impact of where the Fed is in its rate hiking cycle? What's your assessment? So I absolutely agree with Diamond that everything's on the table. Anything could happen. The Fed has said numerous times that they're in a risk management mode and also pointed to geopolitical risks, new risks that could show up along the horizon. I I do think that they're having a real impact even out at the long end, the, the 10-year treasuries. It's The Fed really is looked to as the oracle. Like, let's interpret the data. And I agree with Nick that they have taken a much more sanguine approach that they didn't have to. Inflation had kind of stuck around and wages didn't move down as much as had been expected. And yet GDP has been really strong. And he said, that's OK. We're going to we're going to make progress. And so I think Jay Powell's uh, message was more optimistic than Diamond's. And I think given what we know right now, that's appropriate. And yet, yes, we should prepare for the risks. Claudia, what do you make of the assessments just about recession at this point in time and for Jamie Dimon and what they're seeing, not just in how the Fed is conducting its own policy, but also in the customers that they, they service and really pointing back to the resiliency of the consumer right now? I think we need to recognize the fact that we are leaving 2023 in a much better place than most commentators and probably even the Fed thought we would. Consumer spending has held up. Yes, their wealth has increased. We've had people have built a buffer. It's not just the fiscal stimulus at this point. Like they have set some money aside and that's really important. And most of all, the labor market has continued to be very strong, even as it's moderated some. And that is absolutely crucial to spending and growth going forward. And so far, it's been a rebalancing that has been gradual, slow and steady. And that is the exact opposite of a recession. You could still have one. There are a lot of bad things that could happen. But so far, we are moving in the right direction. I know Nick yesterday really pushed Powell on the recession. Is it in your forecast? And, you know, he said, no, not in the staff forecast. Oh, uh, Nick, um, I want to ask you then, what's your assessment of when you think about how Diamond came across as more, I wouldn't call him like, he used the term of like they're, they stress test, basically. They test for these scenarios of higher rates, right? And we're not at 1982 levels, right? Um, is Diamond too worried or is Powell too optimistic? What's your take? Well, you know, they have different jobs, right? And Diamond's job is to make sure the bank is positioned for any environment. And, and it's I think it's reasonable to highlight the tail risk that, you know, if you pause here and you pause again in December, of course, there is a risk that if the economy is stronger and it has been stronger than people have expected for 18 months now. And if so, if that continues, I think the risk here is, yes, you aren't talking about doing one more rate increase in the first half of 2024. You're talking about doing, you know, maybe maybe more than one, and so that's the risk. At the same time, Diamond said, you know, in that interview, he would be pausing here. Um, I would go back to something Claudia said. I think the tell yesterday was in how Powell characterized the data. He had opportunities to point to, you know, the University of Michigan uh, inflation expectations number, which was high last month. He dismissed it. Not a big deal. He said inflation expectations are moving in the right direction. Stronger consumer spending and hiring, not a problem because we're getting a supply side lift. And so, uh, you know, I thought it was interesting that he just placed more emphasis on the glass half full interpretation of the recent data rather than the glass half empty. Oh, great. Great characterization there. Uh, we'll have to bookmark our conversation, but I want to uh, send our thanks to Nick Tamareos, Wall Street Journal Chief Economics uh, Correspondent, and Claudia Som, Som Consulting Founder, former Federal Reserve Board Economist. Thanks to both of you.
Meantime, we want to yeah. get over to uh, Jared Blickery, who's counting down to the opening bell on a busy day for corporate results. Uh, let's see what stocks are doing in the pre-market. Jared. Yeah, let's take a look at the overall market first. We have the S&P 500 futures up 84 basis points. That's eight-tenths of a percent in the pre-market. And guess what? Uh, I've been looking at some of the results that we had after Fed days uh, going back several years. In fact, to Powell's uh, beginning uh, in, what is that, 2018? as chair and we are we have tended to sell off on these days that is the day after fed day but this is bucking that and so that could be an important inflection point uh, let me just get to uh, some of the stocks that i'm looking at as well i'm actually going to begin with bitcoin because bitcoin has been screaming higher uh, we just completed a bull flag and we have broken to the upside hard to see on this chart let me get a one month and put some candlesticks here is that flag that i was talking about we're, we're already breaking higher than the 35,000 level now if you take a look at this five-year chart, you can see there's tons of overhead supply where we are entering right now. So it could be tough going uh, to get through all of this, but this is an important first step, and I like the momentum that is behind it. So let's take a look at a stock now that is completely unrelated to Bitcoin, Shopify. And does that chart look similar or what? Uh, 2021 saw the peak in this stock. Uh, we do have an uptrend like we do with Bitcoin, but we are moving to the downside, to the bottom of that trend trend channel. And in fact, on a year to date basis, we've uh, broken below. So different short term trend for Shopify than Bitcoin, but the longer one is the same. And I do have some analyst commentary. The movement that we're seeing in the pre-market is because they are seeing, uh, this is from Bloomberg Intelligence, companies adjusted operating margin, quote, shows the inherent leverage in its business model and confirms for us that they're moving away from logistics, that that maneuver was a sound strategic move. Wells Fargo rates it overweight with a price target of 65 and real quick saying the results are impressive and give additional credibility to our bull call on the margins. Now, I want to move on to another stock that looks very similar. Here's a five-year chart of Shopify. Here is Roku. This looks a lot like the other two as well, except for this year, just trading sideways. And after its results, let's see what it's doing in the pre-market, up 16%. So investors really liking what they see there. Let me tell you what JP Morgan thinks. They rate the stock in overweight with a price target of 100. This was a strong report. And quote, what really stood out to us was a profit upside, with adjusted EBITDA turning positive two quarters earlier than expected, critical in our view to building long only interest in valuation support. And finally here, I do want to check out the price action in Starbucks. That stock traded to the upside 10.74%. And you can see been kind of a choppy sideways year, although still holding on to impressive gains of uh, about 55% over the last five years. I do want to get one analyst commentary. This is Citi. Rates of stock in neutral with a price target of 100. Starbucks capped off the fiscal year 2023 with a top and bottom line beat that at first blush will likely get bulls excited, particularly with the U.S. seeing a sequential improvement in traffic versus year over year in 2019. They're calling the re results for the fourth quarter encouraging. Guys. All right, Jared, stay with us for the opening bell. Also, you have to teach me how to make a custom <laughs> channel or tab for some of the specific tickers here on the day. My Wi-Fi Interactive just doesn't do that, even though we have the same one. All right, all your markets action ahead, live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Maybe you can help.
No losses will be borne by the taxpayers. People of America need to know what happened at these banks. Back in March, when a fresh banking crisis reared its head, it wasn't a huge surprise when one man emerged as the financial sector's white knight. Turning now to our top story. First Republic Bank sold to J.P. Morgan Chase this morning in a government-led deal. Jamie Dimon, the 67-year-old CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, is no stranger to stepping in during times of turmoil. In 2008, he rescued Bear Stearns, now a relic of the financial crisis, but once a giant of the investment banking landscape. We did it because we were asked to, he'd say years later. 15 years on, it was Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen who pushed him to reprise that role by contributing billions alongside other big banks in an emergency infusion to First Republic. J.P. Morgan bought First Republic less than two months later from the FDIC. Wall Street's apparent savior was perhaps not the title Diamond was looking for, even if he was destined for it. Diamond's first job was at American Express as an assistant to his father's boss and family friend, Sandy Weil. Weil would become the seminal figure in Diamond's professional life for the better part of two decades. When he left Amex, Diamond followed him. By the age of 35, Weil promoted him to president of Primerica, making him one of the youngest leaders on Wall Street. The quick-thinking number cruncher had truly arrived, but his tenure at the newly created megabank Citigroup would be short-lived. Diamond was cut loose by his mentor, only to bounce back as CEO of Bank One and with a point to prove. He immediately bought two million shares of the company's stock, burnishing a reputation for putting his money where his mouth is. In 2004, J.P. Morgan Chase swooped up Bank One for $58 billion. The joke on the street was that they'd paid $58 billion for Jamie. Now, he's one of the longest running leaders on the street and running a bank whose assets dwarf its rivals. It still regularly racks up record earnings. To some people, JP Morgan is its own economy. The man behind the fortress balance sheet says he is still going strong and at what he calls the most dangerous time he's seen in decades. It's no surprise J.P. Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon is concerned over the outlook for the global economy. As the investment banking giant reported third quarter earnings, he said, quote, this may be the most dangerous time the world has seen in decades. Heightened tensions in the Middle East, the possibility for more rate hikes and fears of a potential recession are putting banks on edge as they continue to prepare for a broad range of outcomes. In an exclusive interview with Yahoo Finance, our executive editor, Brian Sazi, sat down with Jamie Dimon to discuss how escalating geopolitical tensions continue to weigh on the economy. Let's listen. I knew it the day afterwards. A free, democratic European nation was invaded by hundreds of thousands of well-armed troops of Russia, uh, protected by nuclear blackmail. And that nuclear blackmail part, you know, just put in the back of your mind, you want to scare people? We, if you have nuclear proliferation, that's the worst thing. Now, at the time, we said we don't know how it's going to end and when it's going to end. Uh, now it's, uh, you know, not quite two years, but going, you know, it'll be two years in February. You have 600,000 casualties along a 600-mile front with no real end in sight. And it's affecting, you know, obviously humanitarian crisis. But oil and food security is paramount, and it's shown the world we don't really have that. It's stretching all alliances. You know, people trying to figure out who's, you know, who's on what side here. And obviously the most important is what it, it's hurting and damaging the ability of China and America to, you know, strike a better relationship. And so I, I think, and then you have the Israeli Terrorist Act, and those, those things are bad. You know, and, you know, I look at, like, the Berlin Wall. You know, that went up and came down. Not a bullet was fired. You know, you have 600,000 casualties here. And so I look at this, this is maybe a little bit more like pre-World War II. Like, you know, we, we got to get this right. And I think I like the fact that the Biden administration and others now, Mitch McConnell or, you know, and leaders are saying, this is, we need to take care of this. It is for America. Because if we don't fix this, you can have, the world may not be completely safe for freedom and democracy as we know it for the next 100 years. And to do it, by the way, we need very... Obviously, the military stuff is important. We also need diplomacy, development, finance. We have to work with our allies. So one of the one of the problems of the IRA Act was it irritated all our allies. It, you know, it, we don't want to tear asunder the economic alliances because you know all these other people are going to cherry pick. 
And, and so we have to be very careful how this gets navigated you know, over the next five or 10 years. In light of these challenging geopolitical situations, uh, the dif dysfunction we're seeing in government, is that hurting our standing in, in the world at such a critical time? America, I think the way you should look at it in the world is if we reach out our hands to people, people are going to take it. You know, they, they may get mad at us sometimes being a little arrogant, a little bit thoughtless, but we are trusted, you know, and we have, and we're the only ones, and I'm not saying this is an arrogant American, we're the only ones who can provide the leadership because we have the military, the muscle, the might, the money, the capability. We've got to do it in conjunction with allies. It can't be the ugly American. We're not going to get our own way every time. Uh, and I think they understand that. They are rattled by, you know, when they see something, you know, if you, if you look at American policy, it's been less consistent. So they do say, can we trust you? Will you be there? Will the treaty stand? You know, and, I, and those are legitimate concerns. It's not over, but we've created a, a certain amount of uncertainty that I wish we hadn't. For more analysis on these latest comments from J.P. Morgan uh, Chase uh, Chairman and CEO Jamie Dimon, we're joined by Ian Brimmer, Eurasia Group founder and president. Ian, thanks so much for joining us again. Now, you heard that interview and you heard comments that Dimon recently saying this, quote, may be the most dangerous time the world has seen in decades. I imagine you agree with that assessment. What are we not paying enough attention to when it comes to geopolitical risk? Um, well, I think we are now paying attention. Um, and of course, when you do that, sometimes people uh, get shell-shocked by the headlines, as opposed to remembering which of these things are going to be market-moving and which of these aren't. Uh, and Jamie knows better than most uh, that the role of the dollar uh, in the global economy is the same as it was 25 years ago. And the role of the U.S. GDP in the global economy is about a quarter, just like it was when the Soviet Union collapsed. But it is precisely that strength and resilience of the U.S. that makes it easy for the United States to make really bad decisions and really inconsistent decisions and not show global leadership in ways that will hurt the world and in ways that will make other countries much less attractive for investment, ways that are hurting the Europeans ways that are making life more uncertain uh, in Asia, and certainly uh, ways that are making the Middle East fall apart right now. So I, I'm very sympathetic um, to Jamie's perspective uh, that there is uh, a lot of uncertainty about whether the United States is going to be there uh, consistently and strongly for allies going forward. In the last three weeks, in that regard, have been a horrible three weeks for U.S. allies all over the world, and frankly, been a very good three weeks for Iran, for Russia, for, I mean, for the rogues, even for North Korea. And, and nobody really wants that, not me, not Jamie. In this interim period of time where we've seen so much of the disarray play out in Washington, D.C., and, and that has even led to just not even being able to get funds through perhaps quickly enough in some cases uh, with regard to some of the geopolitical tensions that we're talking about. We, we've often seen businesses in some instances stand in the gap um, on other issues, w whether that be social issues or whether that be innovation and Washington catch up. Where do you imagine that business executives are perhaps doing their own either side deal making or even trying to quell fears of some of their allies, their partnerships that they have internationally, where there is perhaps some dismay on the, the government side um, and having clear talks, relations that play out calmly there. Uh, when it comes to geopolitical conflict, uh, companies are trying to keep their heads down. You do not want to be the CEO who is known for making the loudest most impactful statements on Israel-Palestine. You will have your head chopped off by half of your constituents, whether they are shareholders or customers or your workers. Uh, and, and we've seen that happen to a few CEOs, but most of them are holding fire. Uh, the same thing, it's a lot easier on Russia-Ukraine because the entire world uh, was on the Ukrainian side, but that's becoming more challenging, of course, because the U.S. 
is increasingly making Russia Ukraine into a partisan issue, whether or not there should be further support for it. Um, and, and that is undermining, uh, you know, the, the perspective of those around the world that are saying, wait a second, like we're not sure uh, if we're going to be able to continue to lead this fight. So on both of these, I mean, unlike, you know, we can talk about climate change, we can talk about new technologies and the rest, but on geopolitics, the role for the CEO in the public debate is de minimis. Uh, Ian, so one of the things that stood out to me that Diamond said about what's going on, like when you think about the war between Israel and Hamas and uh, the ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine, um, the challenges of safety, uh, the impact to democracy long term, what is the role of the U.S., especially when you think about the war between Israel and Hamas, what does the U.S. need to be doing uh, to shore up the global economic stability? Uh, global economic stability, the United States has to not just display power, but has to display credibility. And, and, and that is the challenge. I mean, you know, reading between the lines, Jamie didn't say it directly, but he was nudging you there. He's like, the United States lacks credibility. He said, we can be the ugly American. We sometimes get in our own way. I mean, you boil that all down. It's something I've been talking about for a few years now, which is that when the wall came down, countries around the world actually really respected American values. They believed the United States stood for something that they wanted to stand for. They wanted their political system to run more like the American political system. Now, you know, fast forward 30 years and you see all of this conflict and confrontation around the world. Why isn't the United States seen as that kind of a leader? And a big part of that reason, I would say a fundamental part, is that Americans increasingly don't know what their country stands for. Americans increasingly don't believe in their own political leaders and their media leaders and their corporate leaders and their finance leaders. There's the divisions inside the United States. You know, democracy globally is not broken. There are plenty of democracies around the world that are showing that they can work ex extremely well. Um, I'd point to Japan, I'd point to Germany, um, the Nordics, plenty plenty of countries. But, but the United States happens to be the world's largest democracy. It's the world's most powerful, I mean, largest in terms of GDP, right? Not in terms of number of people. Um, and it's also the one that is the most uncertain, um, the, the most dysfunctional, um, and the one that is most divided. And, and that doesn't... Yeah. That, the funny thing is that doesn't have much impact on the United States economically, but it has huge impact on the rest of the world. Right. Ian, just lastly, while we have you here, what comes to light with regard to so much, so much of the conflict as it plays out is where there are entanglements economically and what countries are specifically in partnership with other countries for some economic reason or another. And on the other side of that, too, you have an era of deglobalization that we've been in for the past few years here. And so with that in mind, on the other side of the, the conflict that has played out, whether that be Russia, Ukraine, whether that now be Israel, Hamas, how do we get back towards a pathway of reglobalization? Well, we've talked about de-risking now with the United States and China for a couple of years. That's the term of art. Like if you have all this confrontation and uncertainty, then you want less exposure. Uh, globally uh, to the Chinese market and to the volatility and uncertainty that comes from that that country and that relationship. Well, de-risking is not just about U.S.-China. De-risking is about the Middle East. De-risking is about Russia-Ukraine. De-risking is about all of this geopolitics. So as the geopolitical conflicts become greater, as we're in a G0 world, as I call it, not a G7, not a G20, but an absence of global leadership, you're going to see more de-risking. You're going to see people much less comfortable about just-in-time global supply chains because that only works when the geopolitics don't matter. Final point, we had the pandemic for two, three years, and a lot of people thought, okay, well, we have to move away from global supply chains because literally you can't move goods and people from place to place. Fundamentally, yeah. this is much more about the geopolitical recession we're in than about a two or three year pandemic that we're largely out of. All right. Thank you so much, Ian Brimmer. Always great insight from you uh, on the global landscape. Eurasia Group founder and president Ian Brimmer.
All right, we want to do a check of the market action. We're about 10 minutes into the trading day after the opening bell. It looks like investors are in a buying mood so far in the early action. We want to get to Jared Blickery. Uh, what are you watching? I'm watching the Russell 2000, which is leading the way uh, above and beyond the majors. Russell 2000 up almost 2% here. This is what's happened so far this week. Over this past four days, up 4%. Important because that has been the laggard. Here's a two-year chart. We just recently broke below the support. But if we were to come back above and start trading up in here, that would be a false breakdown. And that would be a bullish signal uh, for the short and intermediate terms. Uh, we just got a seasonal buy signal at the end of October. And seasonality didn't always work out as much during the month of October. Uh, but things are looking bullish for November as long as the rate situation is in tow. And it is today. Because look at the 10-year T-note yield. It's down 13 basis points. When it was screaming higher, this was putting a lot of uh, pressure on stocks. Now that it's coming down, that is kind of like the release valve. And that's what we're seeing here. Take a look at volatility. Volatility over the last three months now back to uh, I what I would call the break even. Here's the look at the year to date. And you can see we did get this spike that was somewhat high relative to the other spikes that we got this year, but not bigger than the one we got in March. But now we are heading back down to the south side. Also going to show you bond volatility, the move index. Let's take a look at the two month. That is breaking support and uh, heading down as well. So all in all, uh, we have the, the makings here of at least a multi-week rally, although a lot of people that I talk to are looking to sell into that as uh, stocks rise. Now, here's the sector action. Real estate, which is interest rate sensitive uh, with the reduction in yields and that pressure valve released, that is up 2%, followed by retail, consumer discretionary, then industrials, materials, tech, all of those outperforming. That is a nice mixture to look at here. And here's the NASDAQ, NASDAQ 100, Tesla up 4.6%. Apple going to be looking at that tonight. Here's a year-to-date chart. We have uh, earnings after the bell. Uh, it looks like we are also going to take a look at some of our leaders over the last four days this week. ARC. ARC is the number one. Disruption looking really strong, followed by cannabis, which has been slaughtered recently. Home builders, Korea, uh, solar, defense, all of those outperforming guys. So pretty, pretty risk-on day here on Wall Street. All right, definitely risk on in the aftermath of that Fed uh, decision on interest rates. Thanks so much, Jared Blickery. We've got more of your markets action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
A tale of two drug makers. Shares of Novel Nordisk rising today after the company saw a profit jump some 56% year over year, driven by increased demand for, you guessed it, its weight loss drugs. But it was a different story for Eli Lilly after the company's surprise profit was outshined by a slash full year outlook. So it's interesting to see this weight loss drugs uh, in focus for both companies playing out in two different ways. Novo, again, has this surge in uh, earnings revenue. It's really got the wind in its sails when you think about uh, Ozempic, uh, Wagovi, Eli Lilly. While it did gain steam from Monjaro, mm -hmm. it doesn't have approval yet. Likely expectations are that it will gain approval of it for uh, treating obesity. Um, we already know anecdotally it's sometimes prescribed for that. But Novel Nord is the front runner. But Eli Lilly may end up benefiting from the supply issues there. Yeah, revenue was up during the quarter 37% for Eli Lilly. And this is a company as well. When you think about the FDA's issuance of the response letter for some of their treatments here, um, specifically moving forward and how they are going to try and continue to gain momentum around Munjaro and Verzenio. Uh, they mentioned during the quarter they had another strong quarter in Q3. Munjaro, Verzenio continued to gain momentum. They also said they executed on business development priorities in the third quarter, multiple acquisitions. We talk about how big of a year this is for making sure that any of the companies that are in this biopharma landscape where you have the IP or patent roll-off that's going to be taking place, especially between 2023 and 2024, many of them trying to figure out, okay, what's the next big investment that right. they can make? Is that something that's R&D homegrown or is that something that you have to go out and acquire? It seems like multiple acquisitions, expanding a robust pipeline is what is the focus for Eli Lilly as of right now. But you could stay tuned for more of our interview. We've got the CFO of Moderna. That is coming up in the 10 a.m. hour, uh, 10 a.m. Eastern, uh, 10 a 10 15 to be exact. There you see it on the screen. <laughs> you don't want to miss that. We've also got to talk a little Palantir here on mm -hmm. the day. Tracking shares of PLTR, a strong demand for its AI platform, is giving Palantir a boost on the day. The company's stock uh, and the company saw revenue jump 17% in the third quarter, boosted its outlook for the fourth quarter, now expecting revenue of $599 million to $603 million. Shares ripping to the upside right now by about 19% here on the day, but it's important to remember in context over the course of, of the a year. year. They're doing yeah. really well. It's up 177% for the year. I mean, that's a, you know, if you got in on that at the beginning of this year, you're sitting pretty in terms of shares of Palantir. So uh, clearly investors liking both how they performed and and their guidance. They talked about this strong interest in AI boot camps. That was something that they talked about in shortening the amount of time of revving up training there, um, shortening it for two days right. of training within AI because there's so much demand for this new frontier when it comes to this AI story. So uh, anticipating, as you mentioned, revenue upwards of 2.2 billion, topping 2.2 billion, expected uh, a little less than that prior. So, you know, again, the demand and picture for AI really accretive to Palantir both in the current quarter, in, in the quarter gone, and the upcoming quarter. Yeah, absolutely. And as we continue to think about what Palantir kind of long term is going to be uh, making sure that they're able to do, especially with the with the contracts that they have more broadly here, two areas that uh, a lot of investors here keep a close eye on, that commercial revenue and then the government revenue. The commercial revenue, that was up 23 percent year over year. Government revenue, that grew 12 percent year over year. And especially considering some of the ties that Palantir on the deal making side have into different governments, uh, when you have a period of geopolitical tension or conflict like we do right yep. now, it makes it all the more interesting of a business to continue to track how they're navigating many of those relationships. But their customer count, that also did grow 34% year over year with U.S. commercial customers up and driving that by about 37% year over year. Yeah, and another thing, fourth quarter in a row of profitability had posted its you know, first profit several quarters ago, yeah. some quarters ago. So it's certainly continuing that trend. Uh, Starbucks pricey coffee is paying off. The company's global same store sales rose 8% in the fourth quarter, driven by a 3% jump in customer traffic. Yahoo Finance's own Brooke De Palma has the breakdown. Brooke, good morning.
Good morning, Diane. Starbucks certainly rallying this morning as investors seem to be loving the results as consumers are willing to pay up for their pumpkin spice lattes. We saw Starbucks overall revenue up 11 percent to nearly 4.9 billion, uh, sorry, 9.4 billion dollars higher than Wall Street's estimates, a 9.28 billion dollars adjusted earnings per share also coming in higher at a dollar and six cents compared to estimates of 97 cents. And same store sales globally, as well as in North America and here in the U.S., came in higher than expected, largely driven by that 4% increase in ticket size and a 3% increase in foot traffic. And once again, this uh, these results were largely driven by consumers willing to pay up for those premium seasonal beverages like that pumpkin cream cold brew and pumpkin spice latte. And in addition to that, uh, consumers also added a record amount of food to their order with seasonal items like that baked apple croissant. That led to the six highest sales weeks in the company's history during this quarter. But international same store sales did come in lower than expected. And on the call with investors this morning, CEO Lakshman Narasimhan said while the team is navigating the uncertain economies and markets around the world, customer demand and sentiment remain strong. He also said it reflects the spot that Starbucks has in customers' everyday routines and the long-term durability of the business. I also do want to note that the company now expects fiscal year 2024 global same source sales to be between 5 to 7 percent, and that's down from their prior year long-term guidance of 7 to 9 percent. Brooke, I hate to be the cold water or the cold brew here, but they didn't have as much luck in, in China. And that was one of the weaker spots in this, this quarter's earnings results. Yeah, they did see weakness in their average ticket as consumers in China did pull back on how much they bought per an order. And on a call with investors this morning, Bank of America analyst Sarah Senator did ask about the competition and how the company feels about the business in China moving forward. CEO Lakshman Narasimhan weighed in. We feel very good about the competitive position of beverages, the competitive position of food. Uh, we feel very good about the cash returns of the stores that we are opening. And they're very strong. The team has done a wonderful job in ensuring that the cost of bills are low uh, with the productivity that we have been able to accomplish in our stores. We feel good about the overall returns that we are getting there. And I'm heartened by the, um, uh, you, you know, by how the business is coming together despite all the headwinds that have been there for the last couple of years. Ending Q2 to Q4 of fiscal year uh, 2024, or rather next year, sales in China are expected to be in the range of 4 to 6%, but higher sales growth is expected in Q1 as the company laps those COVID-19 restrictions that happened last year. And they do expect to, and rather continue momentum in China, they do still expect to have 9,000 stores in China by 2025. All right. Thanks so much, Brooke, for diving into the earnings, listening into the call as well. Yahoo Finance's own Brooke De Palma. We're going to stick with Starbucks here for a hot second. Starbucks brewed up strong results in the U.S. in the fourth quarter, but continued to struggle overseas. The company's same store sales in China rose 5 percent, but showed a pullback in orders with average ticket prices falling 3 percent year over year. So how will this uneven recovery impact the stock? David Wagner, who is the Aptus Capital Advisors equity analyst and portfolio manager, joins us now. David, would We'd love to get your broad read on the bright spots for Starbucks earnings report. And we ultimately did point out there that weakness that they did see in China. Yeah, I actually think China was a little bit better than expected. But as you just mentioned and Brooke just mentioned, this was a pretty clean beat. And metrics were basically better than anticipated across the board. And then guidance came on in pretty strong, really nullifying a lot of some of those naysayers. Um, you know, I think that what we saw last when CEOs are cognizant of the macro situation, but they're not talking about a recession at all. I mean, you saw this stock jump after the earnings call. I think investors really welcomed the commentary actually on China, uh, and some of the growth was better than anticipated there. Uh, but mostly from the statements around the momentum that the company continues to see, specifically in North America, you saw strength in traffic, strength in overall ticket spend, somewhat really you know nullifying the bear's thesis that a slowing consumer spending was going to inhibit future results. But the big focus today is actually going to be on the upcoming investor meeting this afternoon, where we should get a little bit more information on the company's annual growth targets and that, that you know new program that they have out there. But the company did reiterate on the call that their long-term EPS guidance is still 10 to 15 percent. 
revenue growth, um, you know, 10 to 12 percent over the next year. But the big question, the big question on investors' minds, I think, were if the company could keep, uh, you know, that really high bar set for the comps outlook, which the company said long term should be around seven to nine percent. But maybe this was somewhat expected. Uh, the company came out and actually guided a growth to five to seven percent. But this shouldn't weigh on the stock too much in my mind, because my math, if you get revenue growth around 10 percent, that actually should equate to mid single digit comps. And, you know, the company's still guided, you know, revenue growth next year of 10 to 12 percent, albeit, you know, Laxman said at the lower end of that range. So maybe this was more of a de-risking event for the company as these comps should be more obtainable. So, you know, I, you know, 9 percent up uh, on the stock take seems seems about right. David, um, I, I know in general the uh, economy has held up well. Uh, how do you think Starbucks is positioned if there is a recession? Well, they're, they're, they're cheap indulgibles in a way. It's like what you always see with like Pepsi and some of the snack products that they have out there. Obviously, you know, the consumer and their propensity to spend has started to come down. You saw that with Visa's and MasterCard's results saying that the October trends on volume really started to slow. But all in all, you know, the consumer still remains pretty strong. And honestly, you know, I know this is it's expensive coffee for Starbucks, but it's still only maybe five, six dollars for, for most of these people buying a cup of coffee. So I, I'm not surprised that the company said that they've continued to see uh, momentum here in the most recent month, and it really just hasn't slowed whatsoever. David, as you think about how this company is also going to balance the ticket in multiple territories here, and especially here in the U.S., where, yeah, there was strength, but at the same time, you've got a consumer that has had to hear the word recession in one form, one conversation, or another for the better part of the past year and change. And so... This is typically looked at as a little luxury. Our, our customers, are you expecting them to push back on price? I mean, my goodness. I, I, look, yes. I, I, got a, I got a Starbucks here this morning, and I'm just sitting there like, how did this go up so much? Yes. Uh, Same. I mean, I'm here drinking my Folgers right now, so I'm, I might not be the target audience. <laughs> but um, a little Folgers in your cup. But that's why I'm actually a little bit more yes. neutral on the stock. I, I've been very confident or become more confident in the company's fundamentals from an earnings outlook perspective. I mean, look at the structural margin improvement that they've had from this reinvention program. It was like 300 basis points this month. It was 100 basis points over the last year. So the, the fundamentals have continued to be strong, but I'm more neutral on this stock because, I mean, I have to agree with you. You have to be somewhat tempered with the expectations due to a lot of these external risk factors out there regarding uh, the consumer, but also some macroeconomic factors in China because they have a huge exposure there. I mean, David, I, I wasn't even the target market for the Barbie Frappuccino, but yet Still found myself buying it. David Wagner, Aptis Capital Advisors, Equity Analyst and Portfolio Manager. David, great to get you some of your insights here on the day and uh, reaction to Starbucks this morning. Cheers. Thanks. Well, Peloton reporting a wider than expected quarterly loss, but more concerning is a weak holiday forecast. The business, now often described as a connected fitness company, has been dealing with declines in its subscriber base. CEO Barry McCarthy put it starkly, the bad news is we were less successful at engaging and retaining free users and converting them to paying memberships than we expected here. We've been keeping a close eye on shares of Peloton PTO and yeah. stock here this morning and shares only fractionally higher by about four tenths of a percent. Yeah, I mean, I, but look at where it is. The share price right now is less than five bucks for Peloton. And yep. you think about this was a pandemic darling where at its peak, I think it was above a hundred bucks a share. Uh, so it's really come down uh, post pandemic. Uh, it does just it, he hasn't been able to turn this company around like he expected. He thought he could convert users who are using the app. I am an app user, but I haven't used it as much. I joined a gym, you know, just like everybody else did post pandemic. Yeah. So that's one of the challenges. How do you keep people engaged and convert them uh, into paying customers? Sure, you have the cult like following. But beyond that, it ended up being a fitness fad. You know, there's so much to think about with regard to how difficult hardware is to consistently produce for a company, how much that can eat into your margins, and if you can't move through the inventory at as quickly as pace, uh, pace as expected, how investors are going to quickly sour on that. They've made some continuous partnerships that uh, they were hoping would come to fruition, perhaps earlier than expected, Lululemon being yep. one of those, which actually allowed them to take one of those competitors out of the market and mirror, and Lululemon essentially uh, 
having a go forward ability to kind of sunset mm -hmm. uh, the need to continue to take that to market and have future iterations where they had to innovate and perhaps outpace some of the innovation that was coming from competition. So more of a win for Lululemon perhaps than it was for Peloton. But at the same time for Peloton, they've been trying to get into more of the storefronts, whether that be physical or digital, yep. Dick's Sporting Dicks. Goods, Amazon, and then even into the hotel realm to make sure that people just have the access point in order to have that first ride for some people or just to make sure that you can log into your account for others who are digital first subscribers right. but not necessarily owners of their own physical hardware yes. connected device that sits in your home and, and for some then people there it's was just Holding Brief, laundry. Right, and there was briefly talk about them being an acquisition target, but as they continue to perform poorly, it just decreases the case for, you know, what is it worth now? Yeah. You yeah. know, so we'll see. All right, we've got more of your markets action ahead, live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Hi, I'm Brad Smith alongside Diane King Hall at the New York, uh, <laughs> at the NASDAQ, NASDAQ in New York City. We are at the New York technically too here. We are about 30 minutes into the start of trading and let's take a look at how things are shaping up here. First and foremost, we got to take a look at the S&P 500 as stocks are extending their gains this morning, initially jumping after Fed Chair Jay Powell confirmed the FOMC will hold interest rates at their current level. Powell left room for possible hikes in the future but said that the committee will proceed carefully. We are also seeing Treasury yields pull back on that news. Meanwhile, let's take a look at some individual names. The resilient consumer is propping up Canadian e-commerce giant Shopify. The company saw revenue rise 25% year over year in its third quarter. And merchant sales across its systems of uh, $56.2 billion, beating analyst expectations. The company has turned itself around following a post-pandemic slump, which caused it to cut about 2,000 jobs. Shopify announced a partnership with Amazon in August and now sees sales driving growth in the mid 20s percentage rate on a yearly basis in its fourth quarter. And in other e-commerce news, Affirm and Amazon are expanding their partnership. Amazon Business, the e-commerce giant's business-to-business -business store, will now include the buy now, pay later option at checkout for small business owners. The service offers loans ranging from $100 to $20,000, rather, and will be available by Black Friday. It is specifically for sole proprietors or small businesses owned by a single person. 
comfortable footwear brand Crocs is feeling a little uncomfy today after slashing its fourth quarter profit and revenue outlook overshadowing strong third quarter results. Cut in guidance was driven by challenges in the company's brand. Hey, dude, the CEO saying in the release that Crocs took, quote, decisive action to shift its strategy around the brand it acquired in 2022. Now, let's get into some market commentary of the day. As the Fed holds interest rates at historically high levels, some banks could start to feel pressure as consumers and businesses pull back on lending and spending. Now, J.B. Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon explained to Yahoo Finance that he runs the company in a way so that it is prepared to serve customers in any rate scenario. He sat down with our executive editor, Brian Sazi, and explained how. Let's take a listen. Well, we run the company so that if there were 7 or 8% long bond rates, we're going to be fine. We, we don't, we don't, we're not guessing for it, but we stress for it. So, you know, we stress for a whole bunch of different things to basically to make sure we can handle low rates, high rates, high rates with inflation, high rates with recession, high rates with real estate losses, that no matter what those are, the team is still in pretty good shape. Fortress balance and, and, and pretty good shape means that we can serve our clients regardless of that. Yeah, and this comes down to a range of risk management scenarios that the company certainly does run. And as they were discussing within that conversation as well, just where yields have moved ultimately and how the bank is mm -hmm. going to pull as many levers as it possibly can. None of this perhaps new to J.P. Morgan Chase CEO and Chairman Jamie Dimon, though. He has yeah. navigated a range of financial crises before earlier this year, the most recent, uh, especially as you consider That's the right bank's right. role in making sure that it can uh, maintain or at least help as best it can to make sure that there is still large confidence in the banking system following the collapse of some of the smaller regional banks uh, led by Silicon Valley Bank earlier this year. Yeah, indeed. I mean, I like what he said about we don't guess for that, we stress for that, or we don't like to guess for that, we stress for that. Uh, so it's clear that J.P. Morgan Chase maintaining its position as the number one bank in the U.S. Uh, there's a reason for its position. I mean, we know they stepped in during the financial crisis. We talked about that, or we heard about that earlier in the show, um, uh, rescuing Bear Stearns. Right. Uh, and, you know, it's been talked about that they were asked to come to the table. And there was even some chatter with regard to SVB about where they stood in that. I don't recall if they were, you know, kind of asked to be a savior, if you will, but they definitely have the strength uh, to be able to come in and rescue these regional banks. And, you know, should there be any more consolidation? Uh, you know, I know he talked in our, the interview with Brian Sazi about just, you know, being prepared for risk, being right. prepared for difficult situations like another recession. Um, and he also talked about even with regard to the interest rate climate, it's not as bad as we've seen it before. Um, and we know the banking sector has more safeguards and more regulation around it now to prevent a scenario like we saw back in between 07 and 09. Right. He says he thinks that there's a chance that inflation is just a little stickier than people think. The fiscal monetary stimulus of the last several years, more than people think. Unemployment, though, very low. Uh, so all of that considered, he, he did mention that there's still a long way to go on inflation. That kind of mirrors what Fed Chair Jay Powell said yesterday, saying and acknowledging that there has been a few good months of data, but as of right now, that not being good enough to take, you know, the, the foot all the way off the pedal at this point. Yeah, yeah. indeed. Well, J.P. Morgan Chase is the biggest bank and in the U.S. It's the leader. The leader, Jamie Dimon, has been commended for leading the firm through financial crises, a pandemic, and more, while only getting bigger and picking up smaller competitors along the way. Following Dimon's exclusive interview with Yahoo Finance on Wednesday night, Wells Fargo Managing Director Mike Mayo had this to say about Dimon's leadership skills. I don't see another Jamie Dimon right now, but that's, you know, you sometimes need to become CEO to get in a position like that. So that's why I call Jamie Dimon the, and his firm, JP Morgan, the LeBron James of banking. But it starts with being warrior in chief, thinking about what can go wrong, not being dismissive about problems. So that's what I'm always looking for, first and foremost, before even the offense side. So is Jamie Dimon the LeBron James of banking? <laughs> Joining us now to weigh in are Dr. Nomi Prince, a geo 
macroeconomist and best-selling author of Permanent Distortion, How the Financial Markets Abandoned the Real Economy Forever. And we've also got Bethany McLean, author of the new book, The Big Fail, What the Pandemic Revealed About Who America Protects and Who It Leaves Behind. It's good to have you both here with us. Uh, and Dr. Nomi, I'm going to go to you first here. When you think about who might be the LeBron James in this analogy that was put forward by Mike Mayo yesterday evening, it is, is Jamie Dimon the LeBron James of bank CEOs out there? Well, he is certainly the most powerful of bank CEOs out there, and he has certainly navigated um, a lot of acquisitions in periods of turmoil in in the financial markets. Um, you know, you have the the graphic up there of Bear Stearns, Washington Mutual, and then uh, First Republic more recently. Um, but it's also important to recognize that the relationship that J.P. Morgan Chase has had um, with the federal government, with the Federal Reserve, has helped. Uh, Jamie Dimon to attain this sort of guerrilla position within the uh, CEOs of, of banking community. Um, Bear Stearns, which I, I used to work at, um, was a, a fallen investment bank for a number of different reasons. Um, J.P. Morgan Chase didn't rescue it. It basically bargained basement it, it um, got in at a very cheap stock price when Bear Stearns was in trouble and had the balance of the risk that Bear Stearns had posed and still was posing at the time backed by the Federal Reserve and the federal government. It didn't hurt that. Jamie Dimon at the time was a class A director of the New York Fed. Um, and, and sort of fast forward, uh, the book has grown of J.P. Morgan Chase from just under $3 trillion to just under $4 trillion worth of assets during that time. But many of those acquisitions have been with government help. So um, it's not like he's the lone uh, sportsman out there. He's definitely um, connected to a lot of help from Washington. Uh, Bethany, I want to ask you um, this question about just your take about how much attention is paid if enough attention is paid to, say, the middle class and below, because one of the things that we've talked about, you didn't hear this yet, but he talked about in, a, in our interview about where the savings rate is um, for the middle class and the bottom 30 to 40 percent, um, which is either zero or near zero. Now, he highlighted that the job market is still strong, uh, so that helps, in general, the middle class. Uh, what's your comment about how much attention that, say, Diamond or J.P. Morgan Chase is paying or should be paying attention to who is left behind? Well, uh, it's it's really interesting. So I was thinking as Nomi was talking, and I know me that I agree with I agree with her I, comments. But another perspective on that is 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 J P Morgan Chase good for good for America, or is it good for itself? And I think this this issue of J P Morgan gobbling up all these smaller banks, what does that actually mean in terms of banks that are available to serve um, um, startup, startup, startup businesses? And then there's this second issue that you mentioned. Everybody's made so much of this federal research that shows that the median net worth of American households grew 37 percent during the pandemic years to say, oh, look, every everything is great. And I was listening to Jamie's data and, and, and thinking, well, th those numbers are a head fake. And the pandemic actually uh, made, made, made matters worse and left and left a lot of people behind particularly disadvantaged kids. And I think Jamie and J.P. Morgan try to do a good job of at least paying lip service to that. But how much can a giant bank actually actually do? Uh, just to follow up on that as well, I mean, we've heard over the course of the earnings season, not just banks, but a lot of consumer packaged goods companies, a lot of even food and beverage industry companies talk about the, the lower income portions of America who are already feeling the effects of a recession. So for a Fed that's continuing to watch to see where there are cracks in the data, uh, those cracks in the data have been there, especially for certain tiers or portions of the consumers in this economy as well, no, uh, uh, Bethany. Well, the reality is that Fed policy has benefited those who are the best off, and it's the effects of Fed policy and monetary and and fiscal stimulus are going to hurt those who are worst off. And what I mean by that is that the chopping of rates to near zero during the last few decades and then during the pandemic has helped the net worth of the richest because asset prices have soared, and it's the richest in our society who own most of the assets. But then when inflation sets in, it takes the biggest bite out of those at the bottom end of the income uh, of the income 
distribution because it's food and it's gas and it's all the staples that that people need and it's rent now which is which is which is which is terrible and so we have this weird system where fed policy which the fed is deeply concerned about about income inequality and about those at the bottom end of, of the spectrum but fed policy nonetheless seems to further the very divides that are so problematic Nomi, I want to ask you this question then. Um, J.P. Morgan Chase is the Goliath. Is it too big now? Um, yes, it, it is. Um, and it has been in the past. And now it's um, about 25% larger than it was um, during the too big to fail days in the uh, circle financial crisis. It is larger. And just to take off on, on Bethany's point and, and why that's a problem um, to the most people in the country is that by them being large, by them, as, as Jamie Diamond talked about, the, the, that they're prepared uh, you know, for, for anything that can happen with rates. Well, there is a ton of consumer debt right now that is on at a record. Credit card debt over a trillion, household debt, total household debt over 17 trillion. All of that debt costs money. And what JP Morgan does by consolidating a lot of those loans into itself because it has grown so large, is it effectively is, is taking money um, more from these Fed rate hikes by virtue of having all of those loans in its purview from the American consumer um, and from the lower income consumers just by default and not being a, and taking over these banks in regional areas um, also hurts people in regional areas ability to get even better class loans at lower rates compared to what JP Morgan might cha charge those same people. So there's a lot of um, distortions that come into effect here um, by virtue of this bank being so big and, and yes, too big to fail again and still, um, and also bifurcating therefore further and with these rate hikes, um, how the American consumer, um, the American citizen is, is feeling um, the effects when rates go down and when rates go up um, on, on, on themselves. On, on the other side of, you know, what we've discussed at length and, and in some cases at nauseum, the risk of a shallow recession or even a mild recession, where do you envision that the banks will have either grown out the number of clients that they have, uh, both on the consumer side and, and on the business side, and as a result of people needing to, regardless of the rate that they may have to kind of succumb to, needing to have access to some type of additional capital or, or line of credit, Dr. Nomi. Well, it's interesting because when you're reporting on the results in the earlier segment um, um, in earnings and talking about Amazon's acquisition of a firm, why is it doing that? It's doing that so it can basically creep into uh, small business loans at higher rates, given the rate environment, um, for the small businesses to pay. And what we've seen with the big banks, um, particularly like J.P. Morgan Chase, Wells, Bank of America, and so forth, is they have decreased um, the amount of small business loans they provide, and they have also increased interest rates at the same time. So that small business person, um, again, is being penalized um, for both being small and in this rate environment by how our, um, our, our banking system is set up and also by other companies um, trying to basically take a chunk for themselves out of how the banking system is set up. All right, we'll have to leave our conversation there for the day. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, Dr. Nomi Prince and author Bethany McLean. We appreciate both of you. We've got more of your markets action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Moderna coming in with earnings today and telling the story of a continued right sizing for the company, just getting over that big pandemic windfall from the past few years. Joining me to break it all down and more is Chief Financial Officer Jamie Mock. Jamie, thank you so much for joining me today. Tell me, what are we looking at? The results are in. You, you certainly have a bit of a loss to look at, but you're still optimistic about right sizing the ship to move forward. Tell us what's going on. Yeah, well, good morning, Anjali. Great to see you again, and thanks for having me. Yes, yeah, so we have a, we have a lot going on. Um, I'd say three things. We can talk about the year and the quarter in terms of what's going on from a COVID marketplace perspective. You mentioned our resizing, which we are pretty excited about what we did for proactively. Uh, and then third, we gave, we're giving quite a bit of guidance around how our, our outlook from 2024 to 2026 and kind of how we're thinking about operating the company. So we can touch on each one of those. But you mentioned resizing, so maybe I'll start there. Um, so yeah, we, I mean, we built our infrastructure for a pandemic and during a pandemic. And we are grateful to all the many partners across the globe, raw material partners, manufacturing partners that really helped us get through it. But as we look, the, the market's not, the volume is just not as significant as it once was during a pandemic. Much of that was to be expected, but it's even probably a little lighter than we thought and we couldn't get into the year. So over the last quarter, we went out, we worked with some of our many partners, and we ended up taking a $1.4 billion tour charge in a quarter. And then we expect another $200 million in the fourth quarter related to the same restructuring. But that really sets us up from a cost of sales perspective, as well as a gross margin improvement perspective. And we kind of laid that out in terms of, you know, at $4 billion of sales, we think we're at 35% cost of sales or 65% gross margin. But we want that we've always targeted and we believe we'll hit that target of 20 to 25% cost of sales uh, and 75 to 80% gross margin over the coming years. Yeah, you mentioned that, uh, you know, looking to break even by 2026. Uh, that is a pretty short timeline. You also have uh, a pipeline that is still maturing and advancing in that sense. I know there are several uh, uh, products in phase three, but we're looking at a, a sort of a slow rollout of, of all of that and, and maybe one or two products additional by 2026. So talk to me about that optimism for that 2026 deadline. Yeah, well, it's, um, you know, really, we understand what investors are concerned about. And they're concerned about, hey, what are you doing from an investment perspective? And when might you break even? And we wanted to explain our thinking. So, you know, we are super encouraged by the organic growth opportunity that we have in our late stage pipeline, as you mentioned. And we think that by 2025, we'll actually bring together RSV next year, flu the following year, uh, our combination product of, of flu and COVID the following year as well in 2025. So, so that late stage pipeline will come and will increase our sales line, which gives us confidence. But that all said, we're also super conscious of our cash balance and the amount of investment we can afford. And we said, it depends on sales. So if we hit a certain sales level, we'll invest more. But if it's not the sales that we expect it to be, we have to adjust. And I don't think investors really understood that from us, but we're fortunate to have $13 million of cash right now at the end of the third quarter. And we said we're gonna use some of that because we think expect a loss in 2024 and maybe even a loss in 2026. But we're gonna not, not let that go below six to $7 billion. And now our thinking is we need to. I mean, the only answer here is growth for us. So that's to get the pipeline out. And there's many more after that. We said 15 products by 2028. So that's just a bit of our thinking. And, and we said by 2026, we're committed to breaking even, either through growth or through disciplined investments. Yeah, so this is definitely putting that windfall to work. You also had a bit of a tax hit. So can you explain moving forward how you're looking at the cash you have on hand, that that great uh, you know ability to fund whatever it is you're looking at? How are you going to allocate that? Is some of it going to be acquisitions? Are you looking at that, or are you, are you looking entirely internally? It's almost most almost the majority, if not all of it, internally. And and we've always been pretty disciplined about our capital allocation in three buckets. One is to invest, reinvest in the business. The second is business development, as you suggest. And then the third is to return excess cash to shareholders, mostly in the form of share repurchases. So uh, we go, the, the first one in terms of reinvesting in the business, that's mostly through research and development and a little bit of capital expenditures. Uh, and that's what I just mentioned. We'll continue it to be relatively high in 2023. It'll be 4.8 billion. We said in 2024, it'll be four and a half billion. 
And then, you know, 2025 and beyond are kind of dependent upon our sales line. If it, if it can go up, it can go up. If it has to go down, it has to go down. So that's going to be the majority of our capital investment for our capital allocation priorities moving forward. In terms of acquisitions, I mean, we've, met, we've done a small one to advance our technology, but it, it, you know, it was like $100 million. We don't anticipate doing a lot, a lot of business development. We mostly partake in collaborations with some partners to advance the science that we need to bring our products to market faster. So we still anticipate doing that moving forward, but from a capital allocation perspective, it's much smaller. And finally, uh, hot topic this year, AI. Moderna is already well in the way of using it. Uh, are there any improvements that are needed there or do you need to allocate any capital that way? And what are your thoughts on sort of the buzz around it right now? Are there opportunities for you? For sure. And I would encourage any investor to uh, listen to our digital day, which is next Wednesday, I think the 8th. Uh, so we'll go through all of this, but to shortcut that and give the key messages, we're super excited about AI. The adoption in our company, I think is nearly is over 50 to 60% of our employees. We measure it based upon the size of a prompt and how sophisticated the response is. And we, you know, that that obviously helps our research and development team bring products to market and get better antigen design and, and many other things. Uh, as it pertains to the back office as a finance person as well, it can improve our controls, it can improve our forecasting, our analysis. So we're really encouraged by it. And that was Yahoo Finance's healthcare reporter, Anjali Kamlani, speaking with Moderna CFO, Jamie Mock. Well, for much more on the markets and on the heels of the Fed's decision to continue with a rate pause, Treasury yields continue to decline this morning with the 10-year yield dropping over 10 basis points. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery to give us some more insights on what you might expect to see. Hey, Jared. Thank you, Brad. And we are indeed seeing the 10-year drop 13 basis points. Looks like market participants are just pricing in a Fed that is probably done hiking, although Paul did not say that himself. Let me just show you what this looks like on a two-month basis. You can see we are well off these highs, which were exactly 5%, 5.0. Going back to 2007, that was the highest point since those days. And you can see we have now dropped off quite a bit. Now, on a year-to-date chart, uh, we are still within the upward sloping trend trend channel here, so not looking as dramatic on this time frame, but let me just show you what's happened over the last three months. Now, this top line, this purple line, and by the way, this represents the entire U.S. yield curve from the short end all the way to the long end down here, 30 years. Uh, but this purple line was what ha was where we were before the Fed announcement. This cyan line that I'm drawing right now, um, that is what's happening today. And then three months ago, that is that orange line down here. And what you notice is we are still up quite a bit from those lows. Um, but I just want to walk through kind of tick by tick what happened yesterday because it's pretty important. There's a lot of data uh, coming through yesterday. We had that Treasury announcement in the morning. But this right here is the net SPY returns. Going back to 2018, what happens around these Fed days? And two things I want uh, you to take a look at. This red line here, this is what usually happens from 2 to 4 p.m. And this is going back to 2022 where we've seen this downtrend. Same thing for the post-Fed day. That's today. That has been trending down as well. But we are seeing the opposite of that. Now, here's what happened in yields. Um, this is what happened uh, yesterday. We got that Treasury funding announcement. We got a drop in yields then. Then we got some jolts data, got another drop. We got the FOMC announcement. We got Powell's uh, briefing. And when that ended, we were down quite a bit from those highs. And if you take a look at what stocks did, kind of the opposite, not quite as bullish as uh, the drop in yields was bearish but nevertheless, I think it highlights what's going on here. Um, also, just want to show what's happening in volatility. Uh, we've seen not only stock volatility, but also bond volatility drop. Hard to see it here on this year-to-date chart, but check out this two-month chart. We had a support here. We just broke through that. So it looks like things are moving in the right direction for risk markets. And the people I'm talking to are looking for this bounce maybe a week, maybe two weeks here. We'll have to see how this evolves. Jared Blickery, great stuff as usual and great point you made, although Powell did not say that. Yes, <laughs> critical. Right. Indeed. We've got more of your markets action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
The athletic apparel space is heating up, and Brooks Running is looking to capitalize here. As you look about and think about this company, they saw global revenue climb 5% so far this year. Mm -hmm. U.S. e-commerce sales, that jumped 25% through its direct-to-consumer business. And year-to-date, the company has racked up 21.4% of the running footwear market in the U.S. For more, we've got Jim Weber, who is the Brooks Running CEO, joining us now in studio Always great to catch some time with you here. Walk us through some of the biggest catalysts that you're seeing in the running market right now that are driving some of these results. For yeah, the it's, a pre it's a pretty unique time. Probably the best marketplace for performance running footwear that, that I've seen in some 20 years. Couple drivers, A, participation solid. Mm -hmm. People are running, people are walking, people are hiking, trail running. There's just so many ways that they're using this product in the gym, on the treadmill. So the participation's there. Secondly, what's interesting is the footwear category is up about 6% year to date, but above $100, the premium price segment, is up 17%. So we're making the cut. Mm -hmm. You know, a consumer with income and assets is, is spending, right. and, and the category we're in is getting a big piece of that. The other piece is that um, it's become the silhouette that's, that's got universality to it. People are using it you know, taking on the plane with them in the gym. So it's a, it's a great time to be in performance running. So how do you stay in front of the competition? Because I feel like I'm seeing more and more Hoka on mm -hmm. sneakers. How do you stay in front of that? There is so much competition right now, and I think it's innovation. You know, I, what's happened to us, we were very disrupted with COVID and supply chain the last two years. Finally, we're back on track with, with product introduction. So we've got a lot of innovation coming to market, and that's the key. We've got nitro-injected uh, midsoles, which are very light, more durable, best cushioning that we've ever put into a shoe, plus broader ranges of color. A new shoe called the Ghost Max that has the glide roll technology that's maximum cushioning. So, so I think you know our category is always driven by product, and we've got a great pipeline coming. So how different is the Ghost Max from the Ghost? Because I'm familiar yep. Yep. with the Ghost. We talked before yep. about you know Ghost, Glycerin, et cetera. Yeah. What's different? Well, the Ghost is our best-selling shoe of all time, and it's, I think, the top-selling shoe in running. The Ghost Max is, is, is along the lines of this maximal cushioning trend. Mm -hmm. Ten years ago, we'd be talking about, about barefoot, but now a lot of consumers are looking for, for maximal cushioning. And the key to that working, because it doesn't flex, it's so thick, is a rocker. Mm -hmm. And so, so that, that's a preferred shoe by some runners, not for everyone, but by many. What runner are you seeing gravitate towards Brooks right now the most as yep. you continue to see the, the consumer out there that is trying to figure out, okay, you know, not just how much am yep. I spending on a shoe, what kind of durability am I going to get out of the shoe? What are the yep. purposes I'm going to use it for as well? I mean, we're sitting here overlooking New York City where we're going to have the marathon yep. in just a few days. So what type of runner is gravitating towards the brand from what yep. you're seeing in the data? I think one of the things that makes us unique is, is, our, is our just obsession with runners and starting there. And then, of course, that silhouette is great for walking and the gym and everything else. But in running, it's that frequent runner, that dedicated runner that's put in a lot of mileage. Because if it works at mile 26, it's going to work at mile 3 for you. So that's why we try to prove the product with people that are putting in a lot of mileage. And the key is to get that second shoe. Because runners know if that shoe is working for them. So that's the core. But then, of course, the speed shoe market with yeah. carbon plates has, has, has just been hugely innovative. And, and a lot of people are looking for that shoe for race day because it makes them a little faster. Springer, springy carbon plate in the shoe. And then, of course, trail. So I think we're competing in every category and segment on the premium side of things. And we're trying to make the best in class product in that segment. But I think in the core of everyday trainers, cushion is a universal truth. And we're doing really well there with with and dedicated then, runners. Then you mentioned the Ghost Max is thicker than yeah. the Ghost. How does it compare to, say, the Adrenaline? Is it a thicker yeah. sole than the Adrenaline? It is. And so what's interesting is the new um, big midsole shoes tend to lock your foot up. It's a rocker. Your foot doesn't move. And for most runners that are doing mileage, you want your foot to move a little bit for most runners. So the Ghost and Adrenaline are right in that sweet spot. When you think about pricing strategy, and for the consumer that we were talking about, where you're recognizing price, mm -hmm. where you're realizing the consumer is still willing to pay up versus yeah. what's also been a, a promotional environment for some of the competition mm -hmm. that's out there too. What, what does that kind of target for full sales of your inventory or full yeah. price realization yeah. look like right now? You know, it's, it's, it's the best environment ever. We're seeing customers willing to pay premium prices. So the healthiest price points are $140, $160, $200. That's new. 
One of the things I think about is, is that gonna be the case a year or two or three from now, especially for that person that's buying three pairs a year? Will they pay you know, mm -hmm. $200? So I don't know the answer to that, but we're building really strong products at every one of those price points. I think, I think running, what's happened now with all the innovation in shoes is the shoe matters. People, and it does, we've always believed that, but for a lot of people, the shoe matters. And so finding the right product for them, um, they tend to create some loyalty around that, even though they're curious and try new things. So it's, it's, it, they've been willing to pay more for this type of product than we've ever seen before. And then in terms of the marathon, which, as Brad mentioned, is coming yeah. up this week in the New York City Marathon. It's huge. You'll have runners from all over the world yeah. coming here. Which brooks are we going to see the most, especially for the fastest runners? You know, it's, it's, it's interesting. 47,000 people, I think, ran this race last year. It's international. It's an incredible race. We had about 20% of the runners, they do high-speed cameras account. We're on brooks last time, so something like nine or 10,000 runners. The number one shoe on course was the Ghost last okay. year, without a doubt. It's right. our top seller. All right, the yeah. ghost, and now we can look forward to the ghost max. Our thanks to Jim Weber, Brooks Running CEO, for a breakdown on the shoe selection and the marathon coming up. We've got more of your markets action ahead, live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
We're live from the NASDAQ market site in New York City. Brinker International, the parent company of restaurant chains Chili's and Maggiano's, raised full-year guidance after stronger-than-expected same-store sales in its most recent quarter. Now, comparable sales improved across both Chili's and Maggiano's thanks to increased menu pricing and favorable item mix, though sales were partially, partially offset by lower traffic, down almost 6% across both brands. The decline in traffic was largely attributed to a decision to de-emphasize virtual brands. But will the company's investment in consumer experience pay off? Kevin Hockman is the CEO of Brinker International. He joins us now. Thanks for joining us this morning, Kevin. So I want to get into kind of this de-emphasis on digital virtual experience. A lot of companies are leaning more into that. What's the rationale behind this? Yeah, you know, it's a, really about focusing on the core business. So uh, we we arguably have uh, potentially the largest virtual brand in the world in It's Just Wings. It's still only you know, 3 to 4% of the business. So it's quite small. And we are spending enormous amounts of time, both operationally and with our marketing spend on it, when all that effort and time and money could be focused on the core business of Chili's. Uh, number one, it's a much bigger business. It's, you know, 96% of our business. Uh, and then number two, it's a much higher margin. Uh, you know, most of the business we transact is in the dining room. Um, we have alcohol attachment. Um, we don't pay additional fees uh, like we do to aggregators in the virtual world. So, uh, it, you know, it's been a decision that we made about 15 months ago and we've been building back muscle. And the good news is the strategy is working. You know, we, we delivered on uh, the top line growth of Wall Street expectations. Um, we had a huge beat on profitability big part driven by this strategy. Um, and then if you factor out the, you know, the virtual band traffic, we're growing traffic ahead of the industry. So we feel like we're very much on track. That's why we raise guidance. I think that's why you've seen the stock pop. Kevin, I feel like Chipotle has their guacamole attachment rate. McDonald's has its fry attachment rate. What is the comparable for, for Brinker? And, and when you talked about the perhaps beverage or the alcohol attachment rate as well, how is that faring amid the consumer environment right now? Yeah, Brad, we got to have you into a Chili's because we got a lot of signature items that are Chipotle's guacamole. So we've got our chips and salsa. I'll come through. Famous. I'll come through. Awesome. They're freshly fried every day. The salsa's made every day. Uh, it's a, it's, it is our signature product. Um, and then we obviously have our margaritas that people love. We're the number one margarita uh, restaurant in the entire world. If we were a country, we'd be the third largest country selling tequila in the world. United States, Mexico, and Chile. So we have lots of signature items in our attachment. And uh, you know, one of our big objectives right now is to continue to innovate um, on those things. So for example, in margaritas, uh, we've got our margarita of the month that you know when Brian's on, he always talks about, and, then, and that's only $6. And then you can uh, upgrade to our Presidente or, 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 other, or other premium margaritas at $9. And then we now have uh, super premium at Casamigos at 14. So we're going to continue to innovate on those things that we're known for because we know that's what drives guests in and that's what's also going to drive check and profits. And then Kevin, I know I've seen your ads. We've all seen your ads for Chili's in particular. Um, how much more do you think you're going to have to do when it comes to increased advertising to uh, maintain uh, tra traffic in your Chili's? Yeah, you know, that's been a big part of the kind of the, the turnaround narrative that we've had on the business. You know, number one was let's put the needed investments in to improve the customer experience, um, whether it's uh, more consistent food, more consistent service, better atmosphere. And then number two, uh, when we start working on that and start making real progress, which we've been doing, um, let's go ahead and turn on the advertising spigot so that we can start bringing guests back into the restaurants. And, um, and that's worked. So we were on a three-year hiatus where we didn't do any television advertising. Uh, we made a big bet this year. We added an incremental $60 million into advertising, and we're about uh, roughly halfway into our fiscal. And that bet's working. You know, we're uh, in October, we talked about it in our call yesterday, we're growing traffic ahead of the industry, even with the resignation of uh, much of that virtual brand business. Um, profits are considerably up because we're focused on the dining room. Um, and we're seeing um, that advertising build over time. So this last, um, round of advertising that we did, we saw, our, our, we saw our highest lift than the previous two. So we think we got a lot of momentum with the cat, with the guest, and our intent is to continue to build on that advertising over time as the guest experience continues to improve. As you focus on the dining room, and, and of course that perhaps gives a little bit more focus around making sure that the expense 
costs uh, on, on that dining experience also make sense over time. Where does that prioritize the digital experience, too? Because we've heard time and time again, quarter after quarter, where some of your competitors are leaning further into digital and, and trying to serve consumers who just want to order with the tap of, of a phone button and make sure that they don't have to leave their lazy boy. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, and I think it's a huge opportunity for our business. We have uh, a very big uh, sales mix in off-premise, 28%. It's pretty much leadership uh, in casual dining. We think we can continue to grow that by improving the experience. We have a huge opportunity, uh, both in the accuracy of our orders and the packaging of our food, um, to really take it to a whole nother level. And so we have a cross-functional team right now working on um, just like we see the fast casual guys do and the fast food guys do, they have engineers and folks that are constantly thinking about off-premise because most of their business transacts off-premise versus in casual dining, it was more of a bolt-on uh, uh, during the pandemic. And so now we're getting laser focused on how do we improve that experience, just like we've done with the dining room. And I'm confident within the next 12 to 18 months, we're going to see a significantly better experience for that off-premise guest, which I think will mean more business even beyond that 28%. Kevin, Kevin uh, one of the things that uh, I, I just want to pull out from a note I have from Stiefel about um, one of uh, a win that you all have with regard to management turnover, which has helped to reduce turnover in hourly employees. What are you doing to retain management um, within the within the company? Yeah, I think we've completely changed the culture of how we um, how we run this business, and so it's really running it from the front lines back into the to the home office so um, many of our officers including me um, are doing listening sessions and listening tours uh, with our managers and our above restaurant leaders to understand what are the things that we can do to better support you and make it easier for you not just to run your restaurants but to make it fun again and to make it fun again for the guest and all of those ideas are being um, churned up here in the, in the home office we're breaking and prioritizing the, the biggest ones, and then we're rolling them out. And what the managers are telling me, I just, you know, we had our manager conference a few months ago, and what they're telling me is like, boy, boy, we feel like we're heard. We're seeing the ideas show up in restaurant, and that's making us pumped up because we're a part of the future of Chili's and shaping it. And so I think that's going to continue. Like, it's just the way that we're doing business now. And not only is it making it um, improving managerial turnover, but like when you think about the middle of the PL, and the margin, um, the margin improvement that we had that we had such a significant beat this quarter in our in our guidance raise, a big part of that is the simplification that's happening inside the restaurants. All right, Kevin, uh, can't wait to perhaps be a fly on the wall in a in a Chili's experience, and uh, you know, more than a fly on the wall, I'll be an active participant. I will be there for uh, you know for the margarita attachment rate. Kevin, thanks so much for the time as always. Hey, thank you, Brian. And one of the, I mean, Brad, I'm sorry. One of these days, I'm, you're going to have me in the studio. I'm going to bring some margaritas in for you guys. Look, okay. game, game, Not done deal. We morning. will do an overflow show just for you after 5 p.m. We'll call it the <laughs> Yahoo Finance Happy Hour. Kevin Hockman, Brinker International <laughs> CEO. Thanks so much for joining us, Kevin. Hey, thanks a lot, guys. Have a great day. All right, you, you too. too. Well, lawmakers remain divided over Speaker Johnson's proposed Israel aid bill that would rescind roughly $14 billion from the IRS budget. Democrat Chuck Schumer called the bill a grave mistake, and it's already drawn opposition from members of Johnson's own party in the House. Johnson's plan to slash the IRS budget could have far-reaching effects for the U.S. debt. The Congressional Budget Office, CBO, estimates that the proposed IRS cuts would reduce revenue by more than $26 billion over the next 10 years, increasing the U.S. deficit by $12.5 billion. Joining us now with more, we've got Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman. Hey, Rick. Hey, guys. Invite me for that margarita show when it happens, please. But meanwhile, uh, <laughs> over in Congress, uh, so why would uh, the deficit get worse and, and federal revenue go down if you cut funding for the IRS? Here's why. Uh, because tax cheats would pay less in, ta less in uh, income taxes. That has been going on for a long time. The IRS has been chronically underfunded uh, for a decade or more because Republicans were generally able to whittle down the IRS budget. And it simply got to the point where it could not go go after people who were not paying the income tax they owe. Estimates of the tax gap, the amount that people owe but they don't pay, are as high as almost $1 trillion. Now, the IRS is never going to be able to find all of that, but Democrats did put a lot more funding in for the IRS last year, and now Republicans are trying to cut that again. Just to clarify, um, the IRS needs to be able to collect all the tax that everybody owes and guess who gets away with cheating on their taxes? It's not ordinary working people. 
uh, who uh, who get a form that says, here's all the tax you owe, they pay all the tax. It's people who make most of their money from investments and find complicated ways to hide their income, i.e. the wealthy. So here's what Republicans are saying. In order to provide this aid for Israel, uh, we need to let um, wealthy Americans cheat on their taxes more. Explain that logic to me. It doesn't compute. And I'm going to be saying this uh, repetitively over and over until this problem is solved, which is to say probably for the rest of my life. We have a problem with the federal debt. It is now becoming a real world problem. It is part of the reason that we're seeing interest rates go up, part of the reason we're seeing mortgage rates go up, credit card loans, car loan rates go up, is because the United States is borrowing too much money. And here come the Republicans saying, hey, here's how we pay for Israel. We make the debt even bigger and we, and we allow people not to pay the taxes they owe. It's a dumb idea and it needs to die. All right, Rick, we always appreciate your insight. Thank you again for the latest on what's on Rick's radar. I uh, want to do a quick check of the markets uh, for where we stand today. Um, we've got uh, stocks on the plus side uh, in reaction to the Fed's latest move on interest rates. That is all for us for this hour. Rochelle Acufo has you for the next hour. Welcome to Yahoo Finance Live. It's 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Rochelle Akufo. Here's a look at what I'm watching this morning. JP Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon says he suspects the Fed may not be done raising rates in an exclusive interview with Yahoo Finance. So what does this signal for the path ahead for investors? We'll discuss. And weight loss win. Novo Nordisk saw sales spike as demand for weight loss drugs drove the company's earnings last quarter. But are they here to stay or just a fad? Plus, food space expansion. Portillo's is betting big on growth as it doubles down on its plan to open more than 900 locations across the U.S. But could the latest consumer trends deter its plans? But first, let's take a look at how the markets are faring an hour and a half into the trading day. Looking at green across the board, session highs here. The Dow soaring here, up almost 400 points on the day, up almost just over 1%. The S&P 500 there also up about 1.5%. 
tech releasing the strongest gains, Magnificent 7 being led by Tesla, which is quite the turnaround for the day. And with that in mind, looking at the tech-heavy Nasdaq, they're up about 190 points on the day, about 1.5%. Well, as investors digest what they heard from the Fed, let's take a look at Treasury yields as we see moving conversely from stocks today. The five year down about more than two and a third of a percent. The 10 year well off uh, that five mark that we saw earlier, down more than three percent on the day. And then the longest term 30 year yields, that's off about three and a half percent so far this morning. Well, the Federal Reserve decided not to tighten monetary policy any further at its latest meeting, that's despite sticky inflation. While the Fed hasn't raised rates since July, they are at 22-year highs. While consumers continue to spend, their savings are dwindling fast. Yahoo Finance executive editor Brian Sozzi sat down with J.P. Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon, and he shared what the bank is seeing from its customers. Let's listen. If this was the average checking account, and make believe it's all one consumer, all that money, at one point they had multiples of what they had pre-COVID. That money is being spent down. If you look at that, what I just said, but you look at the lower, and, and we, there are different ways of looking at it, it's hard to tell, and some inflation adjusts and some don't, but it looks like the lower, call it the third, is back to where it was pre-COVID. They don't have excess savings anymore. And that the middle class is getting close to zero, no excess savings. So how else are high interest rates impacting your everyday finances? Well, I'm joined now by our very own Jennifer Schonberger. So Jennifer, what impact are these rates having? Good morning, Rochelle. Uh, the Federal Reserve's decision Wednesday to continue holding interest rates steady is giving borrowers a break for potentially even higher interest rates while helping savers continue to earn more on their money. But the Federal Reserve certainly kept the door open to potentially even higher interest rates. In general, higher rates are hurting consumers' buying power. Homes are much more expensive with nearly 8% mortgage rates now. Financing for auto loans, credit cards, and personal loans are all up and more expensive. Banks are also becoming more selective in who they will lend to. But higher rates also mean earning more on savings in money market funds, which can juice savings and spending. Consumers are earning 4 to 5% investing in short-term money market funds that can support consumer spending at a time when excess savings is being drawn down. Chatting with James Fishback this morning, founder and chief investment officer of Azoria Partners, he told me consumers are being enriched by higher rates. He says the consumer is earning $1.8 trillion a year in interest income. In the last year, he says you've seen an increase of $600 billion just just from the consumer going into money market funds that pay out higher rates of interest. He went on to say that while excess savings are being drawn down, that doesn't mean savings is going to zero and that there's nearly $700 billion in savings in the economy right now, a cash cushion growing at 5% a year if it's in a money market fund. Now, if the Federal Reserve were to raise rates higher, something that JP Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon told our Brian Sazi last night shouldn't be ruled out, that would mean better news for savers, but could hurt borrowers more, especially those first time home buyers that could see even higher mortgage rates than 8%. Rochelle. Indeed, we're still continuing to see it sort of seep into the economy and, and hit people's wallets in different ways. Appreciate that breakdown. Our very own Jennifer Schoenberger. Thanks so much. Thank you. Well, when the Federal Reserve paused interest rate hikes at Wednesday's meeting, it left the door open for a further move in the future, but didn't commit to further tightening. So what does the committee need to see before finally being done with tightening? We have Esther George, former Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City CEO and president. Thank you for joining us this morning. So what's the playbook here? You have this strong economy, but still, as Jamie Dimon was saying, stickier inflation than people are, are giving credit for at the moment. What is the Fed's playbook when you look at the scenarios from here? Yeah, good morning, Rochelle. It's a very good question because this is a particularly challenging time for the Federal Open Market Committee. And I think you heard that yesterday from the Fed chairman talking about the need to be more confident, the need to be more convinced that these rates are sufficiently restrictive to cool the economy down and to see, which is their ultimate goal, inflation begin to return to that 2% target. So it's a, it's a difficult playbook right now, and I think their patience is a signal that they need to watch carefully 
how the economy is unfolding. And it's difficult, obviously, with the lag. I and mean, we heard Powell talk about this balance between the risks between doing too much and doing too little. But at what point will we know that it has been too much? What's going to break first in the economy that would really signal that the Fed has done too much? Well, one of the traditional ways that uh, you begin to see the economy slow does come through the labor market. And uh, we have not seen that yet. In fact, we've seen quite the opposite, despite these very aggressive rate hikes, this tightening in the federal funds rate. The labor market has continued to add jobs. We've seen more people come into that workforce. And so while the Fed doesn't want to unseat the economy, they do not welcome higher unemployment. Seeing some of that softening in the job market uh, is something I think that will be a clue to them that the economy is beginning to adjust and that the demand is beginning to slow down, which of course is the real aim of their policy instrument. And are there particular data points you're looking at in terms of what the Fed will be assessing when it's looking for more clarity as to its next moves? So the very traditional things, of course, looking at the unemployment rate, They'll be looking at job vacancies, which remain very elevated. They're also, of course, gonna be looking at the rate of inflation. And for the last few months, while inflation has come down from its peak, it is beginning to slow a bit in how quickly it comes down. So I think at their December meeting, when they refresh their individual forecast about where the economy is, you will see there how they are judging this current year GDP and going forward for the next couple of years, they'll be making judgments about that unemployment rate. And they'll also be making judgments about how they see the path of inflation unfolding over that same time period to inform what decisions they will need to make about Fed policy. And with that in mind, um, I want to highlight something else that Diamond said, because he was talking about this sea change that he saw in the number of inflationary, long-term inflationary effects. He talked about the $2 trillion deficit, the largest peacetime deficit ever with this low unemployment that we're still seeing. But apart from a potential recession, not seeing any disinflationary factors. Is that what you're seeing as well? So I, I think that's a fair assessment. If you look at how quickly inflation came down from its peak, I think looking at what often people refer to as the last mile, getting from where we are at over 3% back down to two can be a more difficult road. And the kinds of things that are gonna make it hard for inflation to fall is the fact that consumers are spending. And uh, Jamie Dimon cited some of the factors behind the momentum that consumers have right now in certain categories. We also have seen the strength of the labor market. And I think you cannot underestimate what's happening with our fiscal situation right now. This is a time to look at pressure on higher rates uh, that come from a fiscal situation that most certainly is going to have to be addressed sooner rather than later. And so you raise an interesting point about some of the factors that are outside of the Fed's control when it comes to things that could put pressure on inflation. What do you see as some of the key things that are out of the Fed's control that are still contributing to stickier inflation? Well, you often hear about demographics, and that has been a longstanding structural aspect of our economy that obviously is outside the Fed's control. In many respects, the labor market itself is outside of the Fed's control, other than the impact it has through its interest rate policy indirectly. But looking at who's working, who's coming into that workforce, the skills that they bring to that um, are important. And as I said, fiscal policy clearly outside the Federal Reserve's purview, but obviously they must take into account the impact that that can have on the economy. So at the end of the day, I think the Federal Reserve is clear. Congress has given it a mandate to preserve price stability in the United States, to try to do that in a way that maintains maximum employment. And that is going to be where they have to focus with the instrument they have. And so then as we look ahead then, in terms of recession estimates or whether it's going to be stagflation or what this period is going to look like then, what are your best estimates as to what it's going to look like between here and getting to that 2% inflation target? 
Boy, I wish I'd, I wish I had some clarity on that as well, uh, Rochelle. As you know, I think the chairman laid out yesterday um, why they are proceeding carefully. Because under one scenario, if the Federal Reserve has reached a peak interest rate, and you will begin to see because of lags in the economy and the other factors that come to bear on it, some softening in demand. And again, I see some credible forecasts that are looking into the fourth quarter showing that demand growth will fall uh, below its potential. Those kinds of things tell you that um, the Fed could be adjusting downward at some point next year. On the other hand, it is clear they are not yet convinced that inflation is coming down. And if the consumer continues to spend in aggregate the way we've seen, if you continue to see uh, the job market and wages sustain that consumer spending, then I expect uh, that the Fed will really have to think carefully about whether its uh, next move is to raise rates as opposed to thinking that they're done. So. Those two scenarios, I think, are what have to guide. You can't know which one of those um, are likely to come out. And I think, as you heard the chairman say yesterday, the balance of risk is really settling in around those two scenarios. We'll certainly have to watch how it plays out. As we saw with the regional banking crisis, there can always be some sort of black swan event that throws all of this into flux as well. I appreciate course. you taking the time to join us this morning. Esther George, former Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City CEO and president. Thank you so much. Well, what's more fun than a merger? An amusement park merger. Theme park companies Six Flags and Cedar Fair are joining forces to create a powerhouse theme park company with 42 locations across 17 US states and three countries. Now, the DLC Cedar Fair unit holders receiving one share of common stock in the new combined company for each unit owned, and Six Flags shareholders getting 0.58 shares of the common stock in the new combined company for each share owned. Now, the deal is expected to close in the first half of 2024, with a combined entity worth about $8 billion. Cedar Fair CEO Richard Zimmerman will serve as the combined company's chief executive while Six Flags CEO Salim Basul will be executive chairman. Now, Six Flags shares are higher on the day. Meanwhile, Cedar Fair dipping on the day, down almost 4%. All right, we still have all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Novo Nordisk shares pushing higher this morning. The Danish pharmaceutical company, which recently became Europe's most valuable company, surpassing luxury goods retailer LVMH. They posted record sales growth for the third quarter thanks to the popularity behind its weight loss drug, Wegovi. Now, Yahoo Finance's Anjali Kemlani has the breakdown for us. Uh, I think we knew this was coming, but but this is a, a really big takeaway here. Yeah, I'm glad you framed it that way, Rochelle. Definitely no surprises that it is having a record year, a record quarter, in fact. Uh, Wagovi really driving that sale. GLP-1s across the board, boosting both Novo Nordisk and Eli Lilly today. But uh, Novo reporting that Wagovi, it's a specifically standalone weight loss drug, doing very well despite the fact that the drug is under pressure with manufacturing output as well as coverage decisions by insurers, government, and employers. So despite all of those hurdles, still managing to rake in $1.37 billion for the quarter. That's a 28% jump uh, quarter over quarter. And that, uh, including Saxenda, it's other older weight loss drug, the two combined we're up 200% year over year. Lots of very large numbers here to deal with. Uh, Doug Langa, who's the executive vice president of North America, noted that uh, Wagovi sales were up 476%. Uh, as uh, 67%, sorry, as well. And so that is, and that's in the first nine months of 2023, just to paint the picture of the insane level of demand this company is facing. And uh, they have had to, in fact, curb their output just to make sure that manufacturing catches up. So they are now ensuring that, uh, you know, they have only the higher doses of the drug. This comes in uh, three different doses, dosages, uh, to ensure that the patients who are already on the drug can continue use. And this is a, a strategy that Eli Lilly has also now had to uh, uh, adopt in order to ensure that when Manjaro, if and when the FDA approves it for weight loss by the end of this year, uh, gets on board, that they too don't face a similar situation as Novo Nordisk and, and w- Wagovi. So really just a, a insane story. <laughs> I don't know how else to frame it with these drugs I'm, for the year. I mean, it's true. And when you think of the fact that we've just barely scratched the surface in terms of adoption, I mean, it's, it's be incredible to see where it goes from here. Um, you mentioned FDA approval. WeGovi may receive expanded approval from the Food and Drug Administration within the next six months. So what does this mean for Novo Nordisk's growth and the future of the obesity market? Yeah, so the potential there is actually not broad cardiovascular, right? So I would love to just emphasize that part. That doesn't mean that now it's also just open to all heart patients. But what it does, what it did say is Novo and specifically did a study, conducted a study that showed that it had a potential uh, reduction of cardiovascular disease risk in some patients who are obese. So that's specifically within that obesity population, those who have uh, you know, potential comorbidities, uh, other chronic diseases to worry about, and potential heart risk. That's the population that it could help with. Now, what Onovo is hoping is that this encourages those uh, payers, I mentioned before, the government uh, employers and insurance companies, to then expand coverage for Wagovi and include it because of its additional benefits. We've also seen a number of other studies for the potential of these drugs. And so this could open the door uh, for some of those, you know, really spectacular doomsday predictions that we've seen out there for other sectors. But as of right now, because it's still within a limited population, uh, just to keep an eye on how this actually pans out. Yeah, it's fascinating to watch all of this unfold. Appreciate you breaking all of this down for us, our very own Anjali Kemlani. Thank you so much. Well, to another trend now, the AI hype cycle has swept the nation this year. Talks of artificial intelligence have dominated earnings calls as more C-suite executives are looking to use this advanced technology to build out their company's growth plans. JP Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon is no different. The exec is bullish on the benefits of AI. In an interview last month, Dimon said he believes a three and a half day work week will take place for the next generation, all thanks to AI. 
Our next guest says Jamie Dimon has a very positive and accurate view on the future opportunities and probable outcome surrounding AI. I'm joined by Sultan Megji, former Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation's Chief Innovation Officer and Professor and Venture Capitalist at Duke University. Good to have you back on the show. So, Sultan, what has given you so much confidence about some of these projections that we heard there from Dimon? Well, the most interesting thing about what Jamie Dimon has been saying is that he's fundamentally correct. And we're seeing it in the market. You know, we're seeing significant productivity improvements just in the last three to six months. And it's really unlike anything else we've seen. And he's a fantastic economist, as we know. Overall, the strength in the US economy is being bolstered by these unbelievable productivity improvements. And I think the question is just how long will it take for them to spread across the rest of the market? And with that in mind, then, in terms of where the strength of the U.S. economy is and the potential for you know, AI to disrupt things, what does that do then to the inflation picture? It's a really interesting question, and I don't think any of us have a great answer. You know, there aren't a lot of dis disflationary signals currently right now, and there's a lot of concern about what the rest of the fourth quarter and first quarter of next year might look like. But the reality is, is there are a lot of companies out there that are investing tremendous amounts of money in AI, mostly for efficiency, mostly to streamline back office processes or do automate jobs that were previously done by other people. And if you have an environment where a company of 10 people can operate as effectively as a company of 100 or 1,000, there will absolutely be some pressure on the overall U.S. economy. And Sultan, I want to get your take on this quick clip. Uh, we had an exclusive interview with Yahoo Finance. Our executive editor, Brian Sozzi, sat down with Jamie Dimon to discuss why the Inflation Reduction Act and the CHIPS Act shows promise for the U.S. economy. Let's listen. You also have commitments that are being made. You know, the IRA Act, the CHIPS Act, the green economy, we think will eventually cost $4 trillion. I hope it's well spent, though I suspect a lot of it will not be well spent. Uh, you know, in Europe, when oil and gas prices went way up, they basically financed it for all consumers and producers. You know, so government, and then we have aging populations, Social Security, Medicare. There's a lot of concerns. But there are a lot of things which I say are future inflationary. Mm -hmm. I don't see anything which is future disinflationary. And that's, that speaks to what we were just discussing there. In terms of what we're seeing in terms of disinflationary signals other than a potential recession, how should investors and companies be preparing for this? What sort of investments should they be making? It's a fantastic question. And, and, you know, I'm not an official investment advisor, so take everything I'm about to say with a grain of salt. But I don't see anything fundamentally altering the inflation picture, the rate picture, or frankly, a lot of the jobs pictures, except for things like artificial intelligence. So instead of thinking that we're going to be out of this with quotes around it six, 12 months from now or, or coming out of the next presidential election, we should probably start considering that this is the new normal and that the kinds of disruptions we're seeing, the kind of energy in the overall market could be just like this for the next five years. And so which sorts of companies do you think would be most exciting for investors as we look at this transition to a lot more AI dominance and sort of AI filtering its way into our everyday lives from how we yeah. work, the sort of cars that we drive as well? Absolutely. You know, one of the one of the most interesting things right now is that out of the recent banking crisis, so much of the tech venture capital ecosystem has been disrupted. And so instead of seeing a lot of private companies go through the IPO path or go down the acquisition path by larger public companies, a tremendous number of very interesting artificial intelligence companies are private and, and probably will stay private for quite a while. And so if I'm evaluating the public markets, I'm looking for companies that are fundamentally investing significant capital into artificial intelligence and other automation so that they can be more competitive over the longer haul. Separately, I'm looking at a lot of private companies, private investment opportunities that are fundamentally focused on small, nimble, agile firms, you know, in essence, taking out big legacy competitors. You know, If you have a, an investment in your portfolio and their fundamental technology stack is let's say, two years older than your iPhone, you're, you're probably, you know, you know, you need to think about what, whether that's a good investment. So with that in mind, then, are we expecting something of a shakeout for a lot of these companies that sort of touted AI in their earnings calls and was sort of that, that part mm -hmm. of their sales pitch, but a lot of people, investors at this point, looking for people to show and prove how they're actually going to be using this technology. Are we expecting much of a shakeout? What do you think it might look like? 
It's a great question. I actually am not sure there's going to be a huge shakeout. I, one of the things that that a lot of big organizations have is they have sticky sales. You know, they have multi-year contracts, they have long-term supply chain, you know, infrastructures. What I'm most interested in seeing is are they adjusting to be a more digital, more ad hoc workforce and delivery? And are they actually creating value out of these investments? You know, just because I see a press release with AI, that doesn't actually mean anything. Are they fundamentally doing something to their bottom line? That's the thing that gets me interested. I certainly hope a lot of investors take heed as well and are, are pretty thorough, not just sort of having this FOMO trying to jump on all things AI. Always good to have you, Sultan Megji, former Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation's Chief Innovation Officer and Professor at Duke University. Always good to have you on. Thanks so much. All right, all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Several names in the fast casual space delivered earnings this morning. Shake Shack and Wendy's both out before the bell with slight gains in same store US sales. Joining us now with more is Yahoo Finance's Brooke De Palma. So, Brooke, what were the standout takeaways here? Yeah, well, Wendy's did miss on U.S. same-store sales estimates as they continue to see trade down into the category, but also some consumers feeling the pinch here in the U.S., but they did beat globally. Same-store sales for Shake Shack was a similar story. They did miss on same-store sales estimates as well. But Wendy's saying on the call that if you look at the consumer, it really is a tale of two sides. Over $75,000 income cohort continues to be healthy, and they continue to see growth in that segment. For, for those who make 75 k and less, they continue to be a little bit stressed, and that continues as you go down among lower-income cohorts as well. That led to less traffic during the quarter, as well as uh, some trade-down into the Wendy's value meals as well. But once again, consu uh, consumers continue to look for value at Wendy's. We know about those biggie bag deals as well as their value menu continuing to stand out. And Shake Shack, a more premium category, they did say that they are seeing a normal return to pre-COVID seasonality. And that led to a stronger uh, July and then a softness in August as well as September. And that ultimately led to less traffic in the stores. But they said most recently, momentum has been picked up in October. They're seeing same shack sales, as they call it, same store sales, increase 3.5% in the recent month and traffic remain flat. In addition to that, they aim to present an opportunity to find the right mix between what consumers are looking for in terms of price, 
value, and also Shake Shack known for those limited time offerings that come at much more of a premium value as well. And a busy time in the food earnings space. We also heard from Papa John's earlier today. That stock taking a hit after third quarter earnings missed analyst expectations on revenue for the quarter. What happened there? Yeah, Rochelle, well, I, jumped, I just jumped off the phone with Rob Lynch, CEO of Papa John's, and he said that the miss on the bottom line was driven by the M&A that was executed this past quarter in the UK. He said, so the restaurants that they bought in the UK were diluted during the, uh, during the quarter. But if you look at the core North America operations, their operating income would have been up 12 and a half percent, uh, percent, that is. They also, well, Rob Lynch also added, that he believes that in North America, they continue to remain on top as the only pizza brand of late to deliver positive transactions. He said that investors are also miss missing the transformative evolution of their supply chain model that they announced. And he also added that customers are really seeking value. And it's important to keep a lookout on how Papa John's plays in that third party aggregators. That's where they make a huge portion of their business. But he said they do have a leg up those looking for value going to the store locations and those who are looking for convenience going on those third party aggregators for looking also for willing to pay a more premium price as well. Indeed, continuing to see that more discerning consumer showing up in these earnings reports. Appreciate you as always, our very own Brooke De Palma. Well, fast casual restaurant chain Portillo's delivered mixed results for its third quarter. The company came in line with earnings per share, but missed on revenue expectations. Expenses rose over the quarter, driven by the opening of new locations and increased labor expenses as the company focused on its expansion goals. Now, during the quarter, Portillo's opened two new locations, bringing its total to 78 restaurants. Earlier this year, it announced a long-term goal of opening more than 900 locations across the U.S. I'm joined now by my Michael Osanlu Portillo's CEO. Thank you so much for joining us this morning here. Now we're seeing the stock price not being affected here by what they saw on that on that earnings report here. What do you think is having investors at least confident about where Portillo's is going, especially when it comes to this aggressive expansion plan? Uh, I think your headline is wrong. I think that, yeah, there was a slight miss on uh, comp, but a big beat on the bottom line. Our restaurant level margins were fantastic. Our EBITDA was fantastic. And I think we're the only growth company that can self-fund all of its growth. And I think that's what investors love, is that Portillo's is a highly profitable growth company that self-funds its growth. And so that's why I think uh, the savvy investor is reacting to our stock price based on that. I mean, but I mean, the revenue did have a miss of, of almost four million dollars. I mean, it's a that, so that that headline is actually correct. But I want to dig deeper into yeah. this because a lot of what we're looking at is also the state of the consumer. So, what are some of the changes that you've seen, and how some of your customers are perhaps either approaching what they're buying, or trading down, or making different choices? Yeah, I think the consumer. Look, I think we're back to something that's probably more normal. Uh, going back to the cycles in 2019, third quarter tends to be a sluggish quarter for fast casual and QSR. That's what we're seeing. And we're seeing a bounce back in the fourth quarter. I think we talked about this in our earnings announcement that there's a lot of positive momentum in the fourth quarter. So I think the um, some of the estimates might have been a, too, a bit too aggressive by some of the banks for the third quarter. And I think that you're seeing uh, the fourth quarter play out. I think the consumer is resilient. It's, um, you know, it's a, it's a really interesting dynamic. Um, I, you know, listen to you guys a little bit. Yeah, I think there's a low end consumer that might feel a little bit of pressure. And I think that, that what you're seeing with the low end consumer is a flight to the discount brand. So the big QSRs that discount, but the main consumer, uh, most of those people are, are pretty resilient and they're still enjoying going out to eat and they're looking for great value. Value isn't always just price. It's also the quantity, the quality, and the experience. And so if you can provide great overall value, I think uh, this is a, a fine time for that. And something I did want to ask you about this, obviously the popularity, a lot of this weight, these weight loss drugs, we haven't necessarily, it's very yeah. early days, so we haven't necessarily seen it show up, but there's sort of a mixed picture here. We have, we had a, an analyst from Goldman saying, look, it's actually going to be some of the healthier foods that end up suffering because, you know, people are going to be feeling good and losing weight and wanting to, you know, indulge a little bit more. But then when it came to Walmart, they saw people pulling back on this. What are you seeing in terms of the potential or how are you perhaps bracing for the potential of how these yeah. weight loss drugs might affect business? 
I think there's a lot of speculation. I mean, even the Walmart quote that you're saying was uh, they're speculating that it might be these weight loss drugs. I think that speculation is wonderful for traders who are aggressively buying the weight loss manufacturers and shorting restaurant stocks. They look like geniuses for a quarter. Uh, I think we'll see how it actually plays out. I think people, um, there's a tiny, tiny percentage of people that use those drugs. It's not going to meaningfully move the restaurant industry. So I think right now it's a lot of noise that uh, supports certain trading behaviors, but we'll see if there's any actual reality behind the noise. And something else that we're seeing in terms of trends with AI, you have some food companies who are like, look, we want it to be more of a neighborhood community feel. We don't want, you know, robots serving people. How are you approaching some of the advances in AI, perhaps whether it's supply chains versus in the actual restaurants themselves? I, that's a great question. I think, and this has been an ongoing trend in terms of, um, let's call this labor arbitrage, people using kiosks and other things to displace human beings in restaurants. I think it's going to bifurcate. I think that, that there are restaurant companies and types of people who still enjoy human interaction. So talking to a human being, ordering something, seeing people making your food, I think there are restaurant companies that will do that. I think there are restaurant companies that are quickly moving down the path to being glorified vending machines. And so that's the bifurcation of what's happening. Now, AI and technology that supports back of house activities, prep work, low value added things that neither guests nor team members value, great idea. If you're replacing human beings and human interaction with technology, that's a little bit more of a dangerous proposition, I think, over the medium and long term. Yeah, it really just depends on, on what your style is, I, I suppose, and, and the sort of experience yeah. you want your customers to have. I appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Michael Osanlu Portillo's CEO. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Did you know companies have a sweet spot for the best amount of workforce diversity? Well, a new BlackRock survey has found that companies which sit in the middle of the spectrum of gender diversity, between 16 and 60 percent, have outperformed their peers on a long-term average. And that's good news because since the year 2000, women's representation in the U.S. has increased in several roles, 19 percent in managerial roles, 14 percent among technicians, and 5 percent among professionals, to name a few. 
However, women's representation slims as you look up the ranks, with men making up 94% of CEO positions compared to 6% of women. Additionally, women are still vastly underrepresented across STEM roles. Think IT and engineering, where they make up 27 and 23 percent respectively. The firms say that this translates into a significant wage gap between men and women, with women being more represented in lower wage positions than in higher income brackets. Well, investors are turning a nervous eye to the solar names as the renewable energy industry faces weakening demand and less political incentives. At its helm appears to be SunPower, which cut its four-year guidance on low demand for its systems. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Ines Ferre to give us more details. And I know you've been tracking a lot of this for us. Yeah, and there's several players when we talk about these solar energy stocks. So let's take a look at one that is up right now, Sunrun. The stock is up today after the company reported its quarterly results. But this company is putting in a charge down of $1.2 billion, taking that charge down after an acquisition of Event Solar. That is a peer that it acquired three years ago. And the company said during its earnings call that it is going to be focusing on lowering costs and also selling higher margin home batteries. And the stock is up, as you can see. But year to date, the stock is down uh, about 50 percent, more than 50 percent, because these stocks are taking a hit because of the environment that we're in. We're in a higher interest rate environment. The CEO of Sunrun was talking about this during the earnings call, talking about the volatile times that the, that the industry is going through because of these higher interest rates and also some important policy changes, namely in California whereby the owners of solar panels, uh, when they want to sell back to the grid excess energy, they can't sell it back at the price that they could before. This uh, this policy went into effect this year. So this basically disincentivizes owners or, or uh, people from getting solar panels for their rooftops. SunPower is another company that you just mentioned, also a solar panel and battery energy storage uh, maker. It reduced its outlook on weak demand. But the company says that it's going to be seeing tailwinds in the future because of tax incentives, because of the Inflation Reduction Act that was passed last year that is pouring billions of dollars into the Green Energy Initiative, and also because of higher electricity costs going forward. Because the solar panel makers, the solar panel companies are saying that electricity costs going forward are going to make the solar panel industry more attractive for people. And then you've got Solar Edge, which reports its quarterly results. Right now, it's down more than 9%. The company reducing its guidance for the fourth quarter to $300 million to, up to $350 million. And the street was expecting more than $700 million. So that is quite a haircut for the guidance for the fourth quarter. And part of what happened is what is happening in Europe, which is also another big component of what's happening in the solar industry. And that is weakening demand in Europe. In Europe last year, you saw a spike of installations after the Ukraine war when you saw energy prices going higher. And now that demand is weakening. And the company Solar Edge saying that it's seeing a large amount of cancellations or push out of orders. So that's certainly having an impact on the industry as a whole as well, Rochelle. Certainly speaks to that, that energy transition really not happening as fast or at the same adoption rate as initially expected. Appreciate that. It's update. slow and it's expensive. Yes. Exactly, exactly. Very much so. Thanks so much, Inez. All right, we have all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Closing the deal. Disney has officially agreed to buy Comcast's remaining 33% stake in Hulu for at least $8.61 billion. The two sides now enter negotiations for the streaming platform's valuation. Yahoo Finance's Alexandra Canal has those details. Oh, Ali, this is an interesting one here. Yeah, so we finally have the answer on what's going to happen with Hulu. And as expected, Disney will soon control 100% of that service. Now, under the terms of the agreement, Disney is going to pay Comcast, NBC, Universal a minimum $8.61 billion by December 1st. Now, this represents the floor of what Comcast is owed for Hulu. The two sides will enter into those negotiations. And if it's determined that the value of Hulu is greater than what the floor suggests, Disney will pay the percentage of that difference. Now, Hulu, it's a very great streaming service. If you take a look at some of the, the titles that have come out of that, like Only Murders in the Building, The Handmaid's Tale, it boasts around 48 million subscribers. Disney CEO Bob Iger has said general entertainment content, like the content that Hulu provides, is really core to the company's content strategy moving forward. And that's despite initially telling investors earlier this year that all options were on the table for Hulu. Clearly, he's changed his stance on that. And now we have at least one outstanding issue close to being solved for this company and just ahead of earnings next week. And so, Ali, another outstanding issue for Disney is ESPN and finding strategic partners to help with its streaming ambitions. What's the latest commentary from Wall Street? Because we know sports is always that, that big barrier here that a lot of these streamers are trying to contend with. Now, so we have a new note from Bank of America that said ESPN could be valued at $24 billion and seek a variety of potential buyers there. We do know that Disney has engaged in strategic partnership talks with professional sports leagues like the NFL, NBA, MLB, and NHL. But Bank of America said that there are other possible partners out there like big tech with Amazon and Apple or even telecom giants like Verizon and Comcast, which would help on the distribution side. Now, Bank of America did assume that Disney would want to maintain a 51% majority stake. Hearst already has a 20% stake in ESPN. So that leaves a 36% interest in this sports network when it comes to who a potential buyer could be. Uh, the capital, of course, would greatly help Disney at a time when its streaming efforts have been struggling. They could potentially pare down some of those losses. However, who the buyer of ESPN would ultimately be is a little hazy considering we're in this transitional period for media. We've seen traditional TV declining. We've seen cable uh, really not doing so hot with cord cutting escalating. We've recently saw ESPN financials for the first time and that showed a decline over time in profit. So TBD on who would ultimately want this. We will see even more of those financials next week and ultimately hear from CEO Bob Iger. So we'll just have to wait and see when it comes to that, because you're right, Rochelle, sports is the next big thing in media. Disney needs the money. ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports, but there's also overhanging issues as well. It's true. And then there's also this a lot of overlap because you have some of these companies like an Amazon already has its own streaming service yes. and the risk of sort of competing while also trying to, to complement each other. But then you wonder for advertisers, do they prefer some of these big tech companies in terms of ad space and everyone viewing things on their phone or some of these more traditional entities and sports teams? If you, if you had to place a, a bet on who perhaps would be the, make the most sense as a front runner here, who would you pick? It really depends what Disney is looking for. Obviously, the tech giants like Amazon and Apple, they have the cash. They have a lot of money that they could throw at Disney. But in terms of distribution, if Disney wants to go that route, maybe they do want a more traditional type of buyer like a Comcast or a Verizon. There, there are different ways that Disney could go here and whoever does maintain that controlling stake. Uh, but again, it, it's really up to what people are willing to pay, what people are willing to put the value of ESPN on because Disney obviously is going to go with the highest bidder. Ad advertising, of course, that's been under a lot of pressure given the macro environment. We recently heard results from Roku pointing to a bit of an ad market recovery, but still traditional TV ads in that realm have been significantly under pressure. And we just don't know when that's going to correct itself moving forward. So I think in 2024, hopefully we'll have a little more answers here, especially as Disney really wants to take ESPN over the top for that streaming platform, hopefully by 2025. 
Indeed, we'll see what the next evolution looks like. You certainly set us up for a lot to think about here. Our very own Ali Canal. Thank you so much. Well, JP Morgan Chase is the biggest bank in the US, and its leader, Jamie Dimon, has been commended for leading the firm through financial crises, a pandemic, and more, while only getting bigger and picking up smaller competitors along the way. I knew it the day afterwards. A free, democratic European nation was invaded by hundreds of thousands of well armed troops of Russia. Uh, protected by nuclear blackmail. And that nuclear blackmail part, you know, just put in the back of your mind, you want to scare people? We, if you have nuclear proliferation, that's the worst thing. Now, at the time, we said we don't know how it's going to end and when it's going to end. Uh, now it's, uh, you know, not quite two years, but going, you know, it'll be two years in February. You have 600,000 casualties along a 600-mile front with no real end in sight. And it's affecting, you know, obviously a humanitarian crisis, but oil and food security is paramount and it's shown the world we don't really have that. It's stretching all alliances, you know, people trying to figure out who's, you know, who's on what side here. And obviously the most important is what it, it's hurting and damaging the ability of China and America to, you know, strike a better relationship. And so I, I think, and then you have the Israeli Terrorist Act and those, those things are bad, you know. And, you know, I look at like the Berlin Wall, you know, that went up and came down, not a bullet was fired. You know, you have 600,000 casualties here. And so I look at it, this, this is maybe a little bit more like pre-World War II. Like, you know, we, we got to get this right. And I think I like the fact that the Biden administration and others now, Mitch McConnell or, you know, and leaders are saying, this is, we need to take care of this. It is for America. Because if we don't fix this, you can have, the world may not be completely safe for freedom and democracy as we know it for the next hundred years. And to do it, by the way, we need very... Obviously, the military stuff is important. We also need diplomacy, development, finance. We have to work with our allies. So one of the one of the problems of the IRA Act was it irritated all our allies. It, you know, it, we don't want to tear asunder the economic alliances because you know all these other people are going to are going to cherry pick, and and so we have to be very careful how this gets navigated. You know, over the next five or ten years. In light of these challenging geopolitical situations. Uh, the dysfunction we're seeing in government, is that hurting our standing in, in the world at such a critical time? America, I think the way you should look at it in the world is if we reach out our hands to people, people are going to take it. You know, they, they may get mad at us sometimes being a little arrogant, a little bit thoughtless, but we are trusted, you know, and we have, and we're the only ones, and I'm not saying this is an arrogant American, we're the only ones who could provide the leadership because we have the military, the muscle, the might, the money, the capability. We've got to do it in conjunction with allies. It can't be the ugly American. We're not going to get our own way every time. Uh, and I think they understand that. They are rattled by, you know, when they see something, you know, if you, if you look at American policy, it's been less consistent. So they do say, can we trust you? Will you be there? Will the treaty stand? You know, and, I, and those are legitimate concerns. It's not over, but we've created a, a certain amount of uncertainty that I wish we hadn't. That was our exclusive interview with J.P. Morgan Chase CEO, Jamie Dimon. All right, well, let's get you a final check of the markets as we head into the noon hour. Still solidly in, in the green right now, but slightly off those session highs. We're seeing the Dow here currently up about 380 points, just over 1% on the day. The S&P 500, they're also up about 1.5%, about 60 points there. So far this morning, we're seeing real estate uh, leading the way. Communications, the lag up of all of the S&P sectors in the green so far this morning. Also taking a look at the tech heavy Nasdaq there, up about a, one and a third of a percent, about 172 points on the day. So doing well as uh, the market's digesting what they heard from the Fed yesterday. Well, that does it for now. I'm Rochelle Akufa. I'll be back with you tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern. I'll see you then.